Institute. Unfortunately, not not at this specific master class. Uh, but but we will be available to answer any questions. Very generally, as Sheila was saying, we are a research institution based in Tanzania. We are a Tanzanian organization with a regional um, focus on the international footprint. We work on a wide range of public health uh, issues. Uh, malaria is about 30, 40 percent of our portfolio, but we also work on several other diseases, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, health systems, mothers and children. Uh, a wide range of, 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 uh, of portfolios. And the masterclass series at the moment focuses primarily on malaria, but we will uh, eventually be having uh, the program. Can you ask colleagues to, to, to mute, please? Can you ask colleagues to mute, please? Because there's a lot of background. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, colleagues, kindly mute yourselves. Or you can ask me to mute you. <laughs> but really just just to say thank you all so so much for uh, for joining with us tom um i don't know if you've uh, participated in any of our classes before or if you have any specific questions no I'm, I'm 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 normally doing various things at this time of the day so i i haven't been able to join live but i've watched quite a few online so i'm, I'm thoroughly aware of the the excellent format and, and thank you to you and again to sheila to, for the opportunity and for doing the series because I, i've learned a lot oh brilliant thank you thank you too um, i know that ellie has been has been attending so, so that's fine i just want to let partners uh, participants know that we are now live on youtube and uh, my colleagues at Ikakara will share the link, uh, YouTube channel on the chat, so that anybody who wants to share with their colleagues, they can have that uh, for, for watching later. Yes. Um I see people have joined Fred. We would like to remind um, our participants, for those who are not speaking today, uh, please mute your videos as well as um, your microphones. Um, we will have uh, videos just from Ellie, Tom, Fred, and I. Kindly mute your videos and your audios. Thank you. Shall I think we can begin and uh, just uh, we can start. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Um, once again, we are set to have our, an exciting masterclass. Uh, we had taken a short break but we are gl glad that we are back and um, a number of us have joined. So today we are uh, pleased to host Professor Tom Chacha and Eli Sherad, both from Imperial College. We are going to have an exciting discussion on how mathematical models can be used to determine the best mix of vector control interventions or Malaria, con malaria control interventions, not just vector, given that we have a vaccine in place now. And after that, we are also going to have a look at um, evidence-based vector control interventions, specifically the data that we have on ITNs and IRS and level source management. We are going to take a deep dive on which entomological indicators um, are looked at when looking at the efficacy of this or the impact of these vector control interventions, as well as how to look at or reconcile between entomological indicators and epidemiological indicators in mathematical models. We are also going to um, have a short discussion on how best to integrate RTSS, the new vaccine that we have in place now. We're going to have a discussion on how best to ensure that we are getting the best out of the vaccine and how best to integrate it with the current vector control interventions that we have in place. And after that, um, our speakers will also take us through discussions 
on how best to approach um, trans, uh, I mean, to, to determine or measure the impact of vector control interventions. Um, like I said, looking at both indicators, ENTO and EPI, uh, we are going to look at how best to measure the gaps. Um, we will take also a focus on um, how to look at or what other interventions we should be looking at where, for instance, we have residual ma ma malaria transmission that is caused by um, outdoor biting and outdoor resting mosquitoes. And after that, we are also going to look at um, uh, tools that can be used for decision-making for the NMCPs, where we have a number of tools in place. How do we use the data to determine which tools would be suitable for specific scenarios or for specific malaria transmission um, um, cities? And then we are also look, going to look at um, what is preventing us from um, getting to the finish line. And we are also going to look at how best to integrate all these tools in place so that we um, don't stagnate and we keep realizing the, the, um, the goals uh, that we have put in place for ourselves to eliminate as well as control malaria. Um, and then if we have time, we'll also look at, we we'll also request our hosts to take us through their journey, through their career, as we all know that uh, participants come from very different, uh, um, various backgrounds, and they would like to sort of learn um, from our hosts. Um, so we will be asking questions around mentorship as well. So at this point, I think I welcome our Host today, Professor Tom Chacha um, and Ellie Sherrod Smith. Um, I hope we will have a wonderful discussion today. Uh, Fred, please take it away. Thank you very, very much, Sheila. Can you just confirm you can hear me clear? Yes, I can Brilliant. hear you. And, and we're going to ask Ellie if you could turn on your video. Um, all right, okay. I have to try and pin you at the top. I think, uh, I think it, sure. <laughs> that's good that's good that's good uh, so this is this is going to be wonderful we, we've had a, a break for about a month in, in, in the past I mean there was a lot of conferences and and, and a few other uh, things happening at the same time so we decided that uh, the month of September was going to be a master class free month uh, we are starting in uh, August uh, this is going to be this is today our 31st edition um, and uh, just as a quick note we have confirmations for the 32nd and 33rd editions already and the 32nd edition will happen next week it will be focusing on cost effectiveness uh, uh, co coverage and uh, the scale up of uh, vector control tools and then we will have the 33rd uh, edition which will be delivered by uh, professor chris drackley and tune Bozema, and this will be mostly uh, on measuring um, uh, symptom, uh, infections and the, the importance of asymptomatics. We will talk a little bit about uh, uh, primary school level kids and, and why malaria control programs seem to be you know, neglecting that class, that demographic and what can be done uh, to include them. So a number of things will come around that and we will share this information with you as time goes by. Uh, the next week class will be delivered by Anna Coyne Coyer at uh, um, Josh Yukish and Marcy. And we will, uh, we will provide this information as well. Now, thank you so, so much for joining us. I can see on the line, like uh, we already have nearly 165, 170 people probably, um, if we include people on the waiting line. And, and we are grateful that you are continuing to join with us. Thanks also to our colleagues from Tanzania for joining. I know it's a public holiday there. But this is good. So Sheila has introduced already the, the topics for today. And I would like to begin actually by asking, just discussing and uh, asking our guests to discuss with us uh, what is going to be the next phase or the new phase of malaria control portfolios. And to begin with, obviously, in many, many conferences, and we've discussed this with our experts before, people talk a lot about the gains that have been associated with ITMs. 
it has become clear for us during the past master classes that all these gains associated with ITNs are really just because people decided at some point to invest heavily on ITNs and should not necessarily be interpreted to mean that ITNs are, are better than everything else. It's really about ITNs are good, yes, but the amount of investment on ITNs compared to everything else has been massive. And that as a result means that most of the gains we have had since the year 2000 are attributable to ITN. During that period, however, uh, there's many other things that have come in place. One particular one has been the child formulations of um, um, malaria medication. We also have had socioeconomic developments uh, going on, improved treatments and diagnosis. Uh, other forms of vector control and so on. And I think this is important uh, the context to begin with. And I would actually like to ask Tom uh, and Ellie to begin by just describing in your perspective, uh, going forward, how do we change the narrative so that it's not just about one tool, but a package of interventions. And, and again, I mean, you can take it whichever direction you want, but we feel it's important uh, that this narrative is changed from just being about ITNs to being about, about interventions. Dear colleagues, kindly mute yourselves um, or we will remove you from the call. Tom, please take it up and then Ellie. Thank you, that's, that's an excellent kind of introduction. It's a really good starting question and I think and I think sorry, I got muted. Um, I think all the decisions that have, have been made up to now have been very, very good decisions. But I think you know the, the idea of everybody investing in bed nets, bed nets when they first introduced, they're immensely effective. And, you know, really as, as the paper on, on the screen shows and as your previous guests have talked about, they've been immensely effective, you know. And one of the things that why they were so effective is that, you know, everybody needs to sleep. And this was a tool that was working very effectively in protecting when people slept. Um, now, I think in some respects, the kind of your, your question about, well, what happens next and how do we how we how do we persuade people that actually um, it's going to be much more complicated in the future? I think I think there's no there's no doubt that has to happen. Yet. The thing about bed nets, we had a bed net that worked really well uh, and continues to work really well uh, in many locations. Um, and it was simple to introduce. However, I think, as we're all aware, this can only go so far and there's no silver bullet in malaria. It's not going to be the vaccine. It's not going to be vector control. And so we really do need to layer these interventions on top of each other. So in the past, when there was this kind of one size fits all policy, everybody can got a bed net and you could see how effective that was. It was a very simple idea and it's getting out there. However, we've now got to a point through various reasons why, why that isn't enough. Firstly, uh, because you know, bed nets are very good at killing mosquitoes uh, if they're working well and, and protecting from bites, but they're not going to eliminate malaria everywhere. We always knew this. We know that it can do, they can do an awful lot of good. They can really reduce the burden of disease caused by malaria, but they're not going to be able to eliminate malaria everywhere. And so that we always were going to get to this point. And at this point, then you're going to have to say, okay, what with bed nets or, or what other intervention combinations are you going to have? And secondly, um, as you, as you uh, have seen from your, your masterclass with uh, Professor Corrine and Professor Hillary, you know, and, and Chuck, Professor Wonji, we've seen how uh, mosquitoes now are increasingly resistant to this. So in the past, when there was a kind of one size fits all thing, we could just give out bed nets and that would be effective at re reducing cases. However, as we move forward, uh, the, the situation is increasingly nuanced. As in, we're starting to understand so much more about the mosquito, about resistance in the mosquito, and how best to target interventions in particular areas, given the local epidemiological and entomological situation. And so I think if we're going to continue to see you know, over, over decades reductions in malaria burden, then we really have to start moving to these layering interventions. And that's going to require investment in in people understanding what's going on in their local situation. Really good local entomology, understanding what's going on, because you can't just use a bed net now. We're gonna hopefully have um, more and more different types of bed nets and there'll be an optimum type of bed net to use in that particular situation. 
given the local mosquito dynamics, we're going to uh, have the best option for additional vector control, for example, uh, IRS or, or some of the new tools that are being developed, lava siding, lava source management, all of these things. It's going to be very context specific. So in the past, where you could have this one size for all policy, it was great and it worked. Now we're moving on to a, another situation where everything's much more nuanced. We luckily got more tools and we're going to hopefully get more tools in the near future but we need to understand how we're going to layer those on and i think for me that really understand that kind of really comes down to understanding what's going on in the local context thank you thank you so much uh, tom uh, early so many times when we have spoken to to uh, researchers or practitioners working on malaria it appears to us that it depends so much on what they are working on so Whenever I speak to clinicians, for example, if you say, what do we need to do? The clinicians will say, oh, ACTs are going to face this challenge of resistance, so we need another medicine. Um, if you talk to vaccine developers, you know, it's, it's funny, usually when I visit uh, vaccine developers, uh, clinicians in Bagamoyo, they say, oh, you know, now we have a pre one, we need a, we need a vaccine targeting the liver stage, and now we need a vaccine targeting you know, a, a different uh, stage of, of the vector of, of the parasite and, and combine them. So it appears to me almost like, I mean, that's a joke by the way, but it, it appears to me that, that, <laughs> that people are kind of still quite siloed so that when vector control people talk about combinations that Tom was mentioning, they are really talking about how do you bring three or four different vector control tools together? When clinicians talk about combination, they're usually talking about how do you bring three or four different medicines together? I mean, now you hear people talk about triple SETs, for example, and, and without mentioning like the prevention side or mentioning the vaccine side. How do we share a message here that is much more inclusive that goes back to the basics uh, and, and, you know, in the historical literature, you see that some of the best entomologists were, for example, medical doctors. They treated patients, but they are also very good entomologists. But we've kind of lost that, so people are kind of separated. How do we get back to that, that time um, and make sure that these integrations that Tom is talking about are really cutting across the different aspects of malaria? Back to you, Ellie. Yeah, it's a great observation. and. I totally agree that we need this kind of holistic vision of, of what's going to happen. I think it, get, it gets more and more complicated the more you think about it because you know, everything's going to change now with the climate crisis. You know, we can't keep the structures that we've been in place now. They're going to change. You know, communities are going to be affected in different ways. And it's kind of like thinking, what can we do now for malaria, but also what can we do now for malaria within that context and that changing context? And I don't really, I don't know the best answer for that, but certainly looking at what's been successful elsewhere, it's certainly this collective effort of making sure that the health service is, is free to the people, it is accessible to people, um, building, you know, there's the Bova network that we have. I think that's a really great sort of, start point for that kind of ecological vision building you know malaria out of 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 people's lives as well because that's obviously addressing everything from the root root cause so it, it's it's a really difficult question i think the only way i can see it happening is by making sure you have people from every every one of those groups that, that we're thinking about represented in a conversation and kind of have that education to try and make sure there's space for everybody to have that sort of both speak and and to hear what each other's perspective is and again then it, you know there's obviously a massive challenge at that point and how do you then strategize your your costs you know that we are always going to be limited at, at sort of how you can best use all of those all of those resources in in one space with the with a limited budget so it's it's kind of trying to for me, at least, trying to get those all of those people together to the same conversation, and it, I think it, yeah. it spreads further than just research as well on malaria. I think you need to think about how do we engage with agricultural communities and the sort of departments of agriculture within countries as well, because obviously that's got a huge 
influencing how malaria is transmitted locally. So I think it's a really difficult challenge, but I think that's definitely the conversation to have. Great points there, and and right in the in the on the path of them. I mean, the the, the a major objective of these masterclasses is really to foster such conversations across disciplines. And it's great that you're mentioning people outside the malaria field as well, people who are non-public health as well. Uh, going on, I would like to bring us back to 2017. Um, in 2017, there was a follow-up to the 2011 malaria work on the Malaria is Malaria Research Eradication Agenda. It was first done in 2011. It's a, a, an initiative by MESA, Malaria Eradication, Research, uh, Malaria Eradication Scientific Alliance, uh, based out of ICE Global and Harvard. And they did a fantastic job in 2011 where they looked at what are the key research questions going forward. This was then refreshed in 2017. And at that time, they did something really nice, which was, okay, how do we, can we put together a team that looks at combinations of interventions instead of just looking at, you know, vector control separately and, and you know, the others separately and so on. And, and reading the work that they have, you see two concerns. One is that it's fairly difficult to do a trial on combinations of interventions. Uh, and, and the other is that at the moment we have something that works fairly well, some tools that work fairly well. So ethically you cannot remove and, and then say, I'm going to test something new. So you give me back your badness. You know, you, everything that we evaluate now must be evaluated in addition to the existing interventions. And as a result, they have uh, made it very clear that going forward, the best way to put together these magic mixes is really through mathematical models. This is, this is really the best uh, option to do that. And I would like to request you guys, uh, I mean, your group um, is doing a lot of this uh, already and, and uh, we're going to discuss many, many of these issues, but, but I would like to start with you, Tom, on what you think we see the role of mathematical modeling, uh, not, in, not necessarily in, tech, in high technical detail, but what do you think the role of mathematical modeling here is going to be for uh, national malaria control programs trying to decide what is the best combination of interventions uh, for their for their um, specific settings. So, yeah, that that is the key question, and and I suppose first of all, what I want to say that you know mathematical modelling isn't mathematical modelling models are only as good as the data that can go into them. And so, you know, I think you outlined a number of pragmatic reasons why we can't trial everything. And that is clearly a, an important thing. But what we don't want to do is, is, is use mathematical models as a foil for uh, effectively not collecting the data that we need, because those data are going to be key to making the models more accurate. You know, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out, I think, is, is, is a kind of collective kind of thing to describe all mathematical modelling work. You know, that said, I think, you know, I, th I think you, you can't do you can't do trials everywhere and you can't remove great, great interventions um, and we need to do things on top of them. And it's going to become harder and harder to do these interventions because uh, it's harder and harder to show impact more, the more that you're doing. But, you know, what I would like to do is get to a, a situation where kind of mathematical modeling is is not is not such a kind of discipline that's kind of siloed out to individuals working by themselves but the same way that kind of statistics is used you know everybody everybody has to kind of deal with statistics uh, they might not feel particularly comfortable with it but at the end of their at the end of their um, their paper they've done their experiment they need to embrace they need to find a friendly statistician who hopefully will sit quite close to them and they can go through their their their, their glm together or their statistical analysis and they get they get their p-value and i think hopefully mathematical modeling at some point will 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 become much more kind of widely used by the community and we can generate kind of tools that are actually able to be used by people that aren't aren't you know spent 15 20 years like i have doing this kind of thing um but you know the, the key, and we'll talk about the tool that Ellie's really pushed forward uh, a bit later, but I think the, the key that modelling can do is, is bring these different elements together. And I think there's been a lot of discussion, for example, a combination of bed nets and indoor residual spraying. And, and you know, there are 
there are times when this is definitely worth doing and there's times when it's definitely not worth doing. And a lot of those are, are kind of, you can tease out using mathematical models. But before you actually get to that, you need to do, for example, uh, the experiments just, just to check that they are not interacting with each other in a way that we think could be negative. Uh, and, and, and for example, we can use biological assays such as uh, the experimental HUT trial, which, uh, which Kareem introduced and, and others introduced, that, that can actually do these things, uh, that, you know, that can actually assess the kind of interactions between these interventions uh, and then we can use those to justify justify uh, those decisions in the model so i think i think models can't do this in themselves they they what they can do is they can produce hypotheses that we can then test in the field that will allow us to feel confident that perhaps the models are broadly saying the right idea and so hopefully that's Excellent. where yeah. we you know, we have this uh, ongoing debate about the space race. You know, you know, um, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, your British friend, um, trying to to go to space. Uh, and and you know, on the side of that, there is also a group of people who are trying as much as possible to make it accessible to what they call the common people. Of course, common people might mean a different thing here. But I've, I've seen, I mean, you probably have seen Inspiration4, for example, you have, you know, common people <laughs> go to space. At the moment, people working on malaria view modeling as a very secluded space, you know, uh, a, a very special entity, a uh, very special group of people involved with this. And we used to think of genomics the same way in the past. What are the steps that we must take to liberalize this and, and make it much more user-friendly without necessarily having people be mathematicians. Can, can it be done by non-mathematicians? Ellie, how do we make mathematical models useful for NMCPs, given that NMCPs must do combinations of interventions, but they cannot test combinations of interventions. WHO provides guidelines for single interventions, not combinations, so NMCPs, must do their own mathematics here. How do we make this possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's something we've been trying to do actually, Tom and I, for the past couple of years or so. And um, we have started, because it's quite a difficult thing to do, we've started with just thinking about vector control that WHO's um, recommended. So that's basically nets and sprays at this point, but we want to build in other things like side and. Um, even housing improvement and even um, SMC and, and vaccine and things um, moving forward. But the way, so the way we've sort of approached it is to build a, a sort of web tool that um, people can then play with the different parameters that would change how an, it, how an intervention might play out in any given setting. So for example, if you've got more um, outdoor biting, your net or spray or indoor intervention of any kind might not be as good as another location where that high indoor biting happens. So, so you can sort of start to kind of get this intuitive kind of understanding of how the model captures the mechanism of transmission. So that's the kind of, I guess, aim of, of the tool that we, we, we'll show later on. And um, but so that's one way in, in is to kind of have these platforms that mean people can use the the sort of knowledge and, and the mechanism um, in, a, in a way where the, their data can inform that tool and then and then it can kind of sort of explain what we think at least once it's been validated by comparing the results that we're predicting to epidemiological trials so that's our kind of validation step just to make sure that it's saying something uh, uh, sorry. so yeah so 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 that's one way, but I, I certainly think that you know, try, trying to have conversations where you're trying to break down modeling from being this kind of, as, as, you, as you said, this kind of entity on its own right, trying to break that down and just say, look, this is just a way of thinking about how malaria is transmitted. That's all it is. And it's just a way of trying to capture that mechanism of how a plasmodium parasite is passed between vectors and people and how that's done when you start building in those kind of more real things like immunity, like heterogeneity and biting. So it's it's just a tool to, to try and explain things in a way where we can explicitly write down all of the things we're assuming. So it's exactly what everyone does in your own mind anyway. And it's just a kind of 
way of writing that down. Um, so I, th I think kind of trying to break down that that kind of um, mystique of it, I guess is probably the wrong word, but that kind of having mystique it Mystique is the right word. Kind of bring it into <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, just you must make break the like mystique. Yeah. Thank just you so, so much. Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, so interesting discussions there. Um, recently, not so long ago, a few days back, WHO recommended the use of RGSS for children um, living in moderate to high transmission areas. Um, so, Tom, we would like your opinion, a very general opinion on how this RGSS vaccine will be layered with um, the different interventions that we have in place when we look at the, the treatment, um, uh, fizzle, malaria um, treatment, uh, bed nets and IRS, how does RTSS fit into this intervention? Sure, um, I love your slide. It's like the person with the blood bleeding finger has kind of like surrounded the, uh, the, the, the malaria <laughs> vaccine. I like that. Um, yeah, that is, that is the, uh, well, the, the million dollar question, the billion dollar question that, that this last kind of week has seen and I think I think that you know to kind of to just kind of bring it back slightly you know I think it's absolutely amazing that we've now got a vaccine uh, and it's really great that the WHO has um, has recommended it you know they've recommended it to be used they're not saying it should be used they're just saying we, we think this is something that, that that should be done and the next stage is the really complicated stages in going how how do we use it you know how do we do it without compromising the control that we're already doing uh, and the control uh, that, um, uh, that that we will hopefully do in the future, and you know, I think I think the trouble is with the vaccine. We have this perception, certainly from the kind of childhood vaccines, that these these are are perfect vaccines and they pretty much work for, forever. And you know, and though you know, RTSS is, is is good, you know, it has clear limitations, and so and and currently the cost is 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 quite high. Um, and so, you know, there's been various modelling work done by Swiss TPH and, and, and uh, people within our department, uh, Peter Winsker and Alexandra Hogan, that have really kind of shown that, you know, this is this can have benefit. It's going to have definitely have benefit wherever it's used. But the most cost effective thing um, will depend very much on the setting. And uh, unless costs come down really quite substantially, then, you know, it's not going to be competitive from a direct uh, cost effectiveness ratio kind of way with uh, existing vector control, uh, especially. And, and that's not to say that it isn't useful, it's going to be immensely useful. But unfortunately, we have to live in the pragmatics of the real world. And, and there is limited budgets. And so ideally, what I would like is that this, this, this vaccine, which is great, galvanizes new budgets that weren't available before, and then that should be great to use. Uh, uh, the cynic in me says that might not happen. And so we need to work very hard to show that actually what the best thing to do in a particular situation might not always be, be the vaccine. Um, and so uh, we need to uh, generate that kind of evidence base and communicate that idea. Um, and there are, there are lots and lots of unknowns and I think we need to embrace these, but also we need to uh, just, just not necessarily rely on high technology we need to we need to understand the kind of the basics of what has actually prevented the most malaria cases uh, over the last 20 220 years i would say longer than that but not that much longer interesting tom there i'd, I'd just like to pick what you've said there there are so many unknowns <laughs> yeah briefly briefly what do you mean here well so we, yeah the the, vac yeah, the, the, vac the vaccine is is is, is, is an effectiveness and that, and that that I suppose is the that is that is quite constant and that's why often uh, programs like like uh, the effectiveness of uh, a vaccine because it's quite easy to measure on an individual level uh, because effectively you're looking at somebody who you've given the vaccine to and how regularly they get ill now the problem is with vector control is much more complicated than that because we are working at a community level we're looking at not just we're looking at public health we're not just looking at individual protection and so therefore 
we we know that vector control is is going to be at the current price of the RTSS and others is going to be vector control is more cost effective we think and so where best to use it is, is going to be is going to be difficult and it's going to be very site specific there are going to be sites where it's going to be really effective uh, but there are other sites that it's it, it, you, know, you don't really want to be reducing any of your other tools to to do that so so it's 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 the vaccine side is actually relatively simple, I think, compared with the vector control. But as Fredro says before, you know, you, you think there's more complexity in the area that you work in, and uh, you think there's more need. So uh, I should stress, I'm not, I'm not a vaccinologist, so I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, Fred, any questions from your side? No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, turning back to you, Eli. Um, so apart from RTSS, we have other vaccines other vaccines in the pipeline. For instance, we have the R21, um, the sporozoid vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. How do these all come together in your opinion? How will this all play a role, like specific roles when it comes to um, malaria control? Just a general opinion on this. Sure, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's always good to have um, secondary sort of support for, for, for anything that, you know, you have, if, if, you know, if R21 looks quite good working, I guess, in a similar way to RTSS and targeting similar part of the life cycle. Um, we did some work, interestingly, on, on and trying to pair up um, transmission blocking vaccines and um, uh, the, the kind of RTSS type vaccine um, and found some synergy in the two, but in a, in a, in a sort of mouse experiment. So there's certainly, so it, the reason that worked was because one of them reduced the density of the, in, of the actual parasite in, in the host, and then the other one could work better because it worked better at lower density. So there's potential for these types of synergistic relationships to play out if, if we can develop these, these alongside each other, which would be really exciting. Um, yeah, you know, it's just I think it's exciting that we've got one approved um, now. That's brilliant, and I totally agree that it's got to be very carefully kind of laid on top of everything else. And but yeah, that's, that's it. yeah. And thank I, you. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. The, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sheila. I mean, the the point Ellie says uh, mentioned earlier. We have when Sheila and myself were preparing for the masterclass, we debated a little bit whether we should. Uh, include uh, questions around uh, parasite densities, the uh, role of immunity, role of age. This is an area where Tom and yourself have worked for several years uh, before. We have decided to shift a few of this into uh, Chris Druckley and Tune Buzema's class, but we will invite you guys to, to, to participate in that as, and hopefully chip in as well, because we think that the way uh, uh, this will play out uh, might might not be as expected um, um, uh, really. It was really fascinating to just see uh, the role that asymptomatic cases play, for example, and, and what, what age and immunity play, play there. But now going back to the question that, that Sheila asked earlier on how do we decide where to put the vaccine? I, I think this is another area where mathematical models have been really, really useful, even way before WHO recommended RTSS. And, and here is an example from, from uh, our colleagues in Seattle, um, uh, where they looked at pre erythrocytic vaccines um, ahead of the game uh, and made conclusions that, you know, you would need to first saturate your bed net use, make sure you have very good ITN coverage, and, and then in certain circumstances, such as where you have a lot of outdoor biting, for example, that, that, that the pre-erythrocytic vaccines would give you a lot of value. Now, beyond this, uh, 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 Tom, your group and, and at Imperial uh, has worked um, uh, with uh, um, uh, Dr. Melissa's group, and we hope that we will have Dr. Melissa on a masterclass sometime soon. Uh, I've seen Christian on the line. We're going to try and ask Christian to, to kind, kindly help us get, get Melissa to, to do a masterclass here. But we have a number of questions around this entire work here, culminating into the idea of consensus modeling and how you, how you use this for, for that. To begin with, it appears to us here 
that RTSS will give you maximum benefit in areas where you have very high transmission. Uh, and that this is where, these are the places where you would accrue most gains. Now, without going into the politics of where we get the money from ITNs and so on, in a perfect case where you, if you had all the funding that you had, you had all the decision making, how would you layer this? Would you, you know, scale ITNs to a certain percentage and then take the rest of the funding elsewhere? Or would you saturate first with ITNs and then do that? What, what would that process look like, assuming that funding was not an issue? Uh, back to you, Tom. So, yeah, I think, I think um, actually this, this brings back a point that I should have actually mentioned earlier is in this kind of idea of a consensus model. And I think that's that's really important as well. And I think, um, you know, the same way that the weather is predicted by multiple, multiple models, because no model is right. Um, if, if, you, if you get all these decisions, if you get similar modeling groups that are making different assumptions and use different data to actually um, uh, to, to come, but, and they, they, they occur on the same broad ideas, then you feel much more confident doing that. And I think, I think this paper is an excellent example. Uh, and, and actually four, four, four groups did the, a lot of the malaria modeling uh, impact of, of the vaccine. So IDM and, and also uh, some people from GSK. Uh, I think this is a really good way of moving forward. To your, to your kind of specific question, as in, um, you know, I think, I think different countries are going to choose their own paths. And um, I, I think your statement about um, that has the biggest effect in areas with highest transmission. It depends on really how you're measuring effect. Um, and so, you know, it might be case averted. Yes, then, then clearly if you have a uh, high transmission area where people are getting many, 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 many bites, then uh, they're getting many, many, many infectious bites and then the vaccine will be doing, averting the most cases. However, you know, we can't just look at cases and, and actually, you know, these vaccines might actually be very effective in kind of perhaps more kind of elimination settings where actually getting people to continue to invest in vector control is might be difficult. You're still going to need it. You might have very, very low numbers of cases, but actually uh, you still need that protection from vector control and you need something else to kind of push it over the edge. Uh, and so I think I think that that is also going to be a, a, a place where uh, vaccine will be will be very useful. Um, yeah, you know, if 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 money wasn't an issue, then we'd do it ev everywhere. Um, you know that that would be that would be why why wouldn't you? But um, unfortunately, yeah, real life comes into glaring. Money is going to be an issue. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and, and you know, much as I I hate the kind of god of cost effectiveness, you know, and I've deliberately tried to stay away from this all my academic career. It unfortunately right. does is so important, and and that's why your your masterclass next week is 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 so needed. Yeah, but I mean, this is important because um, the, the figures given by WHO tend to you know people say forty percent. Uh, and 30 percent um, prevention but but the, the actual data from the studies suggest a range you know so there are places that will have higher efficacy a higher effectiveness than others and you're right countries will need to make their own decision based on uh, on, on local evidence so that's important but talk to us a little bit more tom talk to us a little bit more about consensus modeling and we have we have another slide here also from Penny, uh, Melissa Penny's, uh, Professor Penny's uh, 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 work. Uh, but talk a little bit more about the value of consensus modeling and how it's done. Is it, is it just like averaging the values from the different models or looking at them separately? Or, you know, what is this? And is it the right way forward? So, so I, I think it has to be. I think you know. I think the, the kind of the example of the weather is 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 a really good one, and one I kind of continually bang on about. As in, they have the British the British Met Office has I think a selection of a hundred different models or so that they are continually running, and they they each of them give different results, and uh, and then uh, they summarise them and they present. Stupidly, they give you a, a sun or a uh, a, a grey cloud. I don't know quite who thinks this is a good idea, but the models predict in a percentage and they then summarise that percentage in either a sun and a cloud or not. I think it would have been a really great way to get people to understand probability if they'd actually just left the percentage there. But anyway, the point being uh, that, but the trouble is about weather modelling, you've got lots and lots of great data because you can always continually validate your, your models against whether it rained or not, whether you got wet when you said it wasn't going to rain and you did get wet. And so this is where 
this is where those kind of models have a lot of advantage because you can just go through it and you just remove the models that consistently mm -hmm. fail. Uh, unfortunately, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have those quality data. Um, you know, surveillance data is, is really useful, but um, uh, often is, is, is in the kind of countries that we're really most interested in, the surveillance data is, is relatively poor. And often the surveillance data is, is giving quite different kind of answers. So we've been working very closely with the, the team in Burkina Faso, and you've seen over the last 15 uh, years, the number of malaria cases you know, being reported to the health system nearly nearly doubling. But at the same time, you've seen uh, DHS surveys, cross-sectional surveys, kind of halving the prevalence of malaria in their community. And so you know, they're clearly saying, they could be saying slightly different things. There's lots of reasons for those discrepancies. You know, some of the some of the DHS surveys were done in the dry season, so it was more likely to be lower. But those kind of things. So there's no clear answer for malaria. So there's no clear way to validate the models and, and, and do that. Uh, but ultimately, that's where we need to go to is we need to you know, appreciate that all of these models are wrong. But if they consistently give the same idea, then that's probably more likely to be uh, to be accurate. But again, this bases on the based on if, if we're all fitting models using exactly the same data and making exactly the same assumptions because we don't understand the underlying entomology or we don't understand the underlying epidemiology then all the models are going to be the same so it's it's again it's no substitute for actually doing the trials doing the uh, understanding and doing the, uh, the science no thank you thank you so so much and of course the example used here is on on, on vaccines uh, we are very excited about the idea that uh, groups of scientists, usually very opinionated scientists, can actually come together and get a consensus in an organized way. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, I mean, how do you see this idea of building consensus going beyond vaccines to help with? I mean, malaria control, at least where I come from, suffers from this problem of just too many players, you know, just too many NGOs trying to make a decision. Um, um, and, and not always talking to one another. So how do we get this consensus style work as, as, as is clearly happening uh, under the auspices of WHO? It uh, seems like someone has convinced all the modeling groups that you have to sit together and do this. And that yes, has, you get on really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, but, this, uh, this has gone on quite well. How do we extend this beyond uh, malaria vaccines and, and do it much more comprehensively for for malaria control in general. So, so is that I, even possible? I, I think there's a question actually whether scientists should be doing this, and I think I think certainly um, scientists are often um, looking for something that might be strange, and they they're their kind of basis of um, you know uh, uh, their basis of their, their kind of inquisitive mind might might not go to the obvious path and so I, I think about the kind of the uh the example of pyrethroid resistance and i think you know there's a lot of scientific you know, the, the weight of the evidence the weight of entomological evidence the weight of the uh, epidemiological evidence is is really strong but you can always kind of think of reasons why actually it might not be uh might not be uh causing a public health impact you know there's lots of different things and i think we need to make these decisions perhaps take them out of the kind of realm of just purely scientists and actually take them towards the public health professionals who are used to making pragmatic decisions based on a diversity of opinion and including local information context specific information and things that quite frankly i'm ill-equipped to be able to judge and so we need yeah. to be able to put um put the kind of tools from things like consensus modeling into that kind of sentiment and have consensus entomology. We need to have, we need to have consensus, all of these things. And I think actually these public health professionals are the people that are actually good at doing this. And I don't think perhaps scientists are the best people to do that. Thank you. And here clearly WHO played a big role. And I'm going to ask Anybody in the audience who wants to chip in in this conversation about, you know, how do we get people to work together, uh, as has happened here, uh, you know, just let us know uh, and, and we'll, we'll bring you in uh, briefly if, if you want to have a conversation to, to get to talk to us about that. Uh, in the meantime, let's go back a little bit to the issue of cost. So in the media in the past week, uh, you know, the the, it, it, to me, it even appeared like some kind of two groups of thoughts, you know, people saying, stick to what you have, 
don't divert attention, don't take money away and put on RTSS. And some people say, no, you have to, <laughs> you, you have to bring this tool in. How does cost play here when you have a vaccine that is imperfect and vector control tools that are also imperfect? And then it is uh, financing is in, the, in these circumstances with global fund, you know, money dedicated to particular tools. How does cost come in here? And how do we ensure that we still get the best decision uh, without, you know, uh, people feeling like money is being taken away from uh, intervention X? I, I see Christian's hand. With your permission, Tom, shall we bring Christian in? Please. Good. Christian, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Fredros. I think that especially the RTSS story is a wonderful opportunity to actually increase the envelope for malaria control because there is a, a huge pot of money available to pay for it, which is Gavi. So I think that's really typically an opportunity we should seize, first of all, because I think somebody posted already the comment that reducing severe cases by 30%, it's a no-brainer. It's fantastic and we should have it. And secondly, somebody else will probably pay for it. So there is not going to have to be a, a compromise on this one. So, and, and I think having the vaccine, and we saw that last week created a really nice dynamic in a time when I think malaria control is a little bit perceived as kind of stabilizing or if not faltering. So I, I think this one is truly a no brainer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Tom, did you want to? No, I, I completely uh, agree with Christian, and, and I'm very impressed with the backdrop. Um, but uh, uh, it's it's it, if, if this is an opportunity to galvanise people uh, who would not be normally funding malaria, then it should be grabbed with 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 three hands. So we should be seeking more money instead of fighting about who gets the money. You know, yeah, completely. Yeah. Let us proceed, and, and uh, uh, as sh my colleague Shayla um, uh, said earlier, we, we're going to focus a little bit now more on, on, on your um, uh, other works. And we would like to begin with um, this year. When, when we were, Shayla and myself did our PhDs at the same time in the same lab, and this was perhaps the most uh, widely read paper at the time. Uh, it's, it's a paper from Imperial. Um, and, and, and you guys participated in this as well. And this is the first time, you know, they were talking about ITNs are not enough. You must have um, new tools uh, going forward. And, and I think for us, this was really, really important that it's, it's possible to bring in all this information and put it, put it together and, 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 and have some kind of, you know, decision um, um, uh, for that. One, one particular thing that is interesting here is just the number of options. If you look up there, you see things such as MSAT, you see things such as twice yearly um, uh, IRS and, and so on. We talk about combinations, but there's also the actual strategy of doing it. You know, which one comes first? Uh, what is the frequency uh, and, and, and all that? Would you guys want to maybe yourself or Ellie uh, talk a little bit more about, you know, what are the things that we must look out for when we are trying to put interventions together instead of just saying put ITNs and IRS together? You know, in your opinions, based on your practice, what are the factors that you think are core that we must look at uh, to inform whatever combinations we're going to have of vector control and any other tool? Ellie. Ellie, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, it's a really important question. It's a really difficult one, I think. Um, I guess the I guess the way I think about it at least is to try and think about what if, what's the like, mechanism of which of the different interventions and what sort of part of the transmission sort of cycle they are affecting. So something like nets, your reducing mosquitoes you're reducing the bites on somebody um, but then you're not necessarily looking after their sort of health health or your you know so so maybe pairing that up with something like mass drugs administration 
kind of has has quite a good kind of coupling because you you're then attacking two different parts of the 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 mosquito and the, the transmission of malaria so I think that's actually where modeling can be quite a useful tool because you can start to play with these different elements of of the of the structure so you can start to think about okay what if I can reduce the force of infection and then look at interventions that can do that or maybe look at what if I can reduce the, the severity of disease and, and how can I pair that up with, with everything else? And so that that is one nice way of, of, of how these types of models can, can really sort of start to be useful tools because you can really play with those metrics and you can do it in the almost in the absence of having an actual intervention. You can say, OK, well, these by affecting these two parts of that transmission pathway, I get the biggest the biggest impact I can reduce malaria the most so it's kind of it's quite interesting just to do it in that in that kind of almost toy example but then when you do have the actual interventions and you can show you can recreate what's seen in epidemiological trials and then then it becomes really powerful because you can start to say okay this is what we see with nets now this is what we see with the, the next tool and the next tool and you can you can play with them in terms of the order that you put them in, and in terms of the um, the kind of magnitude you use, and so on. And actually, Pete, Pete Winskill did a really nice piece of work on this. I think in um, I think it was two thousand and seven, his his publication, um, where he was looking at exactly that question of of how do you order kind of nets, and then maybe spraying, or maybe um, RTSS, and I think there was another SNC maybe, um, and and he looked at different levels of prevalence in, in the community and, and then actually the answer came out as sort of different in different situations as to which order you should do it to get the best benefit in terms of the most cases averted and the most alley saved. So um, I think there's, there is ways to do it and I think modelling is a nice, nice approach um, to that problem. Um, but it is, it's a really difficult question too, especially if you can't, as, as everyone's touched on, you can't validate it with actual epi trials if you haven't been able to do that combination in a trial. But okay. yeah. One thing we see is that, the, the, as you can see on the graph up there on the top right, um, very clear linkage between entomology and, and epidemiological um, uh, indicators. And it, it seems to us that the models uh, you run of Imperial um, are, are best to a certain extent on the idea that where you don't have epidemiological data, you can learn a lot already from the entomological data. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know. Ultimately, with the majority of the, the, the gains have been done through vector control, and so that is dependent on your local local entomology. You know, I, th I think I think some of the dangers of just using entomology is that we actually you know. Entomology is noisy. It's very, very noisy. Um, and our sampling methods are incredibly noisy. The numbers of mosquitoes fluctuate hugely. And so actually generating um, uh, effect sizes for different interventions using entomology alone is actually really, really hard. You need really, really large, high powered studies to be able to do that. And it, and it depends on what your outcome is. And, and, and sometimes in some certain situations, entomology might be easier if, you, if it's well powered it might be easier to detect something than say for example if you go into Bikini Faso or somewhere with really high malaria transmission and you try and assess an intervention looking at changes in prevalence then it's very hard to do because the force of infection is so high that actually it's really hard to do and what models can help you indicate is actually where best to uh, to do these kind of trials if you need them you need to perhaps move them to somewhere uh, where perhaps had a lower level of transmission if you want to use um uh, malaria prevalence, for example, as your, your endpoint, uh, or if you're going to do clinical instance, then perhaps you want to do it in a higher transmission setting. So actually, you know, I, I would worry about moving too quickly to entomological measures, though they're really important for explaining what's going on. I think it's often quite difficult to actually uh, robustly measure the effectiveness of some, with some of the tools that we have, which quite frankly, haven't really changed, you know, uh, in, in, in a long time. Um, we're still relying on EIR. And, and you know, that, that graph on the top right-hand side looks quite nice, but you plot anything on a log scale and it looks quite nice. Fred, you're muted. Back to you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank oh, you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you, Fred. So I think at this point, I'd like us, Tom, to take a step back and really take us through the basics of how modeling was done using this paper as, um, as an example. Um, we were talking previously with Fred about how indicators are selected. So entomological and epidemiological indicators are selected, what you consider good data when it comes to AP and ENTO, what you consider bad data, you know, just that process using this as, as, as an example. Tom, please. Okay, so I think I think I think the kind of the kind of framework, and I think I think a, this is not just us, but lots of modeling groups kind of do this. The, the key thing is understanding how you uh, you quantify the effect of something, and 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 how good your model is at capturing it. So so uh, different groups have done this you know, for the last twenty years. We've tried to kind of parameterize our models. So working out how effective a type of vaccine is or working out how effective a type of bed net or IRS is with a different type of um, data. So for example, for, for vaccines, it might be uh, looking at uh, the, uh, the change in reinfection uh, you know, challenge studies or, or something like that uh, to, to see how the effectiveness of the vaccine changes over time. Uh, and, and you can do that in kind of experiments such as challenge studies, or if you're looking at vector control, for example, if it's indoor vector control, you can evaluate the effectiveness of a bed net uh, using experimental HUP trials or IRS in experimental HUP trials. And then you use that model, you characterize that, that effectiveness. You see how, for example, bed net uh, killing of mosquitoes changes over time. And, and you see how from this kind of really good assay how blood feeding inhibition changes over time and then you put this into a mathematical modeling framework and you use this kind of like entomological data that you've got so these kind of these uh these complex biological assays to parameterize the models and then you take that model and you see if it can recreate the the type of dynamics that we see in uh malaria so uh so it's a different it's an independent way of validating the model so you fit your model using for example entomological data and then you test your model using epidemiological data so changes in malaria prevalence over time after those interventions were introduced and that gives you a kind of uh, a kind of independent way of validating not only the kind of effectiveness measurement that you have of the intervention, but also of the modeling structure that you're using to convert malaria, uh, convert entomological outcomes into epidemiological outcomes. And so, you know, even a stop clock is right twice a day, but if you do that enough times, you get hopefully some confidence that actually those entomological, in this case, uh, assays are, are have benefit in predicting the epidemiological income income sorry outcome i wish it i wish it was income um so it's it's that kind of it's that kind of framework and and i think i think to do that we need good quality both entomological data and epidemiological data and then the models to translate those to the two and that should hopefully give us some uh confidence that what we've done can be extrapolated or elsewhere because you know for example you're never going to be able to do lots of lots of clinical trials but if they're done in different settings with different entomology, different epidemiology, and the kind of mechanistic structure of the malaria model is able to predict the different efficacy in those two different locations, then that gives you some confidence that you can extract to other locations as well. And that shouldn't be the end of it, but you know, it, it, it is the start of the process for getting people to start to believe that these actually are a useful tool. Because for me, for one, you know, I, I was originally... A, I think, I think I should probably stress actually both me and Ellie were both originally ecologists we didn't we weren't we didn't go down the mathematical modeling route uh, mathematical training route that lots of our colleagues have done uh, we were both kind of uh, you know I, I ran around collecting weevils for a living um, and it's it, it's it's uh, sorry I've got slightly distracted <laughs> the weevil just confused me um, we go, <laughs> It's, it's being able to kind of translate these things into this kind of framework that allows us to, uh, to have some confidence and hopefully feel other models are used. Because what we don't want, people shouldn't believe models just because they produce pretty, pretty curves. And I think we, it's, it's our job as modelers to really to show the evidence base of why we think these models can be believed to a point. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And, and that, I think, brings me to 
Um, my next question, just a short one about um, modeling for low transmission areas where you really don't have entomological data, robust entomological data. You don't have EIR, and I see EIR is being used a lot. What happens in such cases? So, so I, I think we have to acknowledge the uncertainty of, of what's going on um, in low transmission areas and actually how good models are at doing that. Um, because at that, in that setting, it becomes really driven by, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you're near elimination, it, the number of malaria cases gets driven by imported cases from abroad. And so you're not going to be in a situation, much as I would love it to be a situation, unless we have some kind of fancy new tool, we're not going to be eliminating mosquitoes. And so there's going to be mosquitoes, and they're going to need to be continually controlled. And if an area is near elimination and somebody walks in with malaria, there will still be mosquitoes and you still get, might get small chains of transmission. And we see this in America. There are small chains of malaria transmission often in America because they've got lots of anopheles that can transmit. You know, those chains are snuffed out pretty quickly, but that's, that's the kind of end game of, of malaria transmission. And the chance of that happening is a really kind of random process. And so I think, I think models really need to be and that's going to depend on behavior and all this kind of complicated heterogeneity. So I think you really need to take modeling in a layer elimination setting to a, a, with, a, with a big pinch of salt. Um, uh, but uh, there are kind of statistical methods that we can actually start doing this, but there's going to be a huge uncertainty in those models predictions. Thank you, Tom. Back to you, Fred. Uh, no, just a quick probe and, and, and then uh, I'll, I'll send this back to you, Sheila. But, uh, a uh, quick probe here to something that Tom mentioned, and, and Ellie, you can chip in as well. If, 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 uh, uh, this is right. Several times we have conversations with our entomology colleagues about how to collect mosquitoes. And uh, recently we've been having a particularly interesting conversation about human landing cages and, and how, how we should do them, what kind of data uh, they're going to give us, how useful they are. Uh, from your experience uh, doing this, what kind of feedback uh, do you give, what, what are the, the key things that you think you would need from entomologists? Um, you said earlier in, in your response to Shayla's answer that entomology data is messy. Um, what are the, what if you were to, to, to advise on how to improve that, um, that side of things, what would that be? Uh, Ellie and then and, and Tom. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it's 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 a great sort of conversation we have quite often. I think with the, the teams that we work with, um, and I'd, I'd say so. There's a few things. Um, first of all, as Tom's mentioned, this kind of night to night variation is difficult to kind of really understand. So the sample size needs to be really carefully thought about. So how 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 big a sample size in terms of the number of houses you look at, um, the, the number of um, nights that you're surveying for across any sort of period. Um, the, the, so if you have a higher density of mosquitoes, maybe that needs to be a lower number than if you've got lower densities of mosquitoes. Um, I appreciate those are quite broad, low and high. To, to, I'm not giving any sort of guidance on that quantity. But um, so that's one thing in terms of just thinking about what sample size would actually reflect what's going on. And then the other thing I think that is really crucially important, it doesn't really happen, is um, understanding what the community is doing in, in over the course of an evening as well or a night. So yeah. we, we need to, so the reason we want to understand the human biting um, is to understand that, that overlap time when people and mosquitoes are both able to contact each other and, and, and provide a blood meal. So we, we really need to kind of make sure that when we're capturing human landing catch, we're also thinking about any, any way we can start to think about how humans are act, accessed by those mosquitoes that are active. So if you have a community with lots of outdoor jobs at night or something, or the community that has certain nights of the week where you, you congregate outside or you know whatever the situation is, that means there's overlap between mosquitoes and humans biting um, or activity, then, then you can get a transmission event. So that's, at the moment, we have a lot of human landing catch data, but not so much understanding about how different communities are active over those hours of, of when mosquitoes are most active. 
so that's certainly something I know it's not entirely entomological but yeah. I think that's an important um, piece of information that we, we tend to, to, to not have um, and then the way modelers think about it I guess is we we have um, a probable pathway of a mosquito feeding attempt and we have certain uh, things that inform that in terms of the data so things like the, the a proportion of bites on humans that's an important parameter for us to understand um, things like uh, the indoor and outdoor biting sort of how you know if that's more or less and um, that's that sort of happening and, and um, we have we have we have we have uh, some slides actually from from your work on outdoor biting as well we, we're going to bring those uh, those up one last question on this and then and then we move forward shall i do you want to take that or shall i shall i do Okay, can I, can I just add, add another, yeah. sorry, just, 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 yeah. just a, a call for kind of local knowledge, because yeah. the sampling is going to be immensely dependent on the local environment you have. So, for example, if you have one constant source of mosquitoes that's fairly constant over time, then sampling is going to be much easier. If you have mosquito breeding sites that are coming in and out, and mosquito emergence is changing substantially over time, then quite honestly, you need a PhD project to be able to just to assess what your sampling scheme should be in that location because this kind of long complicated seasonal variation is is really hard and in that situation if it's for example fluctuating it's best to perhaps do sampling twice a week but seven days apart so you're getting perhaps the the emergence and then the decline in the number of mosquitoes then perhaps doing say three days consecutive which would be biased by that kind of that that kind of tipping point and so I think this is the reason why entomological data is often so noisy is because it's just really locally context specific and should be driven by local expertise. Thank Sorry. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, one last question on this. Um, one reason that you guys and also our colleagues at Swiss TPH, uh, people at IDM, people at, at, uh, at, at um, um, uh, in Denmark now, with, with the geostatistics modelers there, uh, uh, Northwestern, several modeling groups. You've kind of created, sorry guys, uh, with the little noise on the side. You've created this uh, ecosystem where, you know, the, the structure is already designed and whenever you, someone asks you a question, how will intervention X perform here? You just plug it in and, and you can, you know, you can kind of generate an answer, a tentative answer to help with iterations. So assuming that we wanted to set up something like this at Ifakara, and my colleague, uh, Samson Kiware is trying to set up, you know, uh, systems like this to, to help the local uh, 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 groups there. And, uh, um, you know, what does the basic structure look like? Uh, what is it that we need? I know this has taken you guys many, many years to build, you know, to have this. But, it, it, it's increasingly important for us that you have groups in the countries, at least one group per country, where you, you have a, you know, some kind of a substrate upon which you can throw your interventions. What does it take to set up a, a modeling engine uh, 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 locally? And I know this is a very broad question, but you can give a broad answer. So, so, so in my opinion, I think, I think the statistics is a really good a good comparison statistics you know is something that we're all a little bit good at uh, but probably don't feel confident enough writing our own generalized linear model instead we use a function in r that we, we we understand what's going on but we don't know the nuts and bolts about it now i think modeling hopefully will get to a point where you know some of the stuff that samson's doing is absolutely great and he's he's, he's doing really good modeling and, and and stuff like that and and that's and that's a different thing but we need to kind of educate i think the community first about what models can and cannot do and that doesn't necessarily need detailed mathematical knowledge or anything like that that's just understanding the kind of strengths and weaknesses of the thing and once we've got this kind of cadre of people that feel confident criticizing a model feel confident understanding the different bits and doing that so I think generally the community needs to get better at doing that and then and then you just need to you know as these tools get built up i think like any discipline in science you know as it gets more and more done it gets easier for people to plug and play different things and and you will always get people that are designing their own stuff like like samson and his colleagues you know producing really great models but then you can get other people that can plug and play and use tools that others have developed the same way that i use statistical tools that other people have developed and, and could use myself 
Thanks, and, and it's, it's wonderful to see the chat, the conversation in the chat. Uh, thank you guys so, so much. Uh, it's great to see the, the teachings also by Professor Pierre Carnaval. Uh, uh, Pierre gave us one of the earliest master classes, and we hope that we will have him back at some point. Um, and for those of you who do not know Pierre, yeah, you know, his, his, his group in 1987 treated for the first time the modern day ITNs. So it's, it's, it's great to have you, have you here. Uh, uh, Professor Carnaval, and and it's great to also see the other comments uh, from Eric and everyone else uh, on this. So let's let's go forward. Uh, Sheila, did you want to ask any specific question on this, or shall we move forward? No, let's move on, Fred. Cool. So we're going to move forward to a different context here. Uh, usually, for this question, we use maps from Tanzania, but we were told last time, hey, you got to, There are many other countries that also do subnational stratification. So, so. <laughs> Uh, Professor Noor uh, kindly accepted to, to give us some slides from WHO here with, with data from Nigeria. So on decision making for the local context, you are talking about people having to make a decision that is best suitable for them. For this decision making, you have to kind of, you know, slice and dice your country and decide where uh, you need to take which tool. And, 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 and here is an example from Nigeria of how they would do that. If you just focus on the upper layer, of, of how this can be done, okay? Now, I think this is a fairly acceptable now uh, on, on the current GTS refreshed strategy and, and many national governments and NMCPs are already taking this strategy. And, and we are very, personally, I'm very happy to see that, uh, uh, that happening. But when you read this, you also see some of the work that you guys have done around the question of hotspots. And here is an example of work you've done with uh, uh, Professor Buzema um, uh, on hotspots uh, that are defined not necessarily with the idea of administrative boundaries. You know, uh, it's really just about you know small scale or large scale. Where do you have most malaria? Where do you have least malaria? And they make some pretty good points. And we would like to spend some time to discuss uh, this. The first question we have here is how come uh, the simple aspect of heterogeneity drives uh, um, um, the, the uh, R naught numbers for malaria so high. I mean, what is it about this that happens? The second is uh, the, the point about non-random movements of, of malaria. Uh, Professor Philip Markle is probably on the call as well. In one of his early works, he demonstrated that mosquitoes remember where they last fed. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that is the case, then it means there will be very little mixing of, of infections uh, around that. So there, there are quest many questions around these hotspots. The first question we have really is how do we merge this idea of hotspots with the stratification agenda that is being scaled up so, so nicely? Uh, and in fact, uh, from conversations with, with the experts before, we've also learned of the idea of micro stratification. You know, so how do these things you know, uh, uh, come together? How do we put on this idea of hitting the hotspots with the idea of subnational stratification to optimize your vector control? Let's start with that, uh, Tom. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely definitely the way, the way forward. Um, you know, I, I think we also need to be fairly aware of some of the frailties of some of the geospatial models. You know, the geospatial models are great because what they do is they there's very limited data and they leverage space and time much better than, than anything else. But they do give the impression sometimes, well, they don't give the impression, they're very open about their uncertainties, but uh, that some of these things are quite definite. Um, and, and so I think you really need to kind of verify some of these kind of hotspots are are uh, are actually really really hot spots um and and i think you know you also have kind of hot spots of malaria but you have you know you have quite a lot of geographical variation in other factors for example pyrethroid resistance might be uh really high in an area but actually looking at some of the data it kind of breaks down as you move away from the site and you, if you do two samples at the same site you get quite good congruence but then as you move further away you get harder and harder and actually it's very different and that could be because of different species or, or mosquitoes so you've got these really complicated kind of spatial scales of malaria uh, mosquito density which is causing the malaria uh, but then also perhaps uh, the effectiveness of the interventions as well and how that changes um so you know i think i think this kind of fine scale heterogeneity, fine scale uh, modeling is is 
is really important, but it needs to be based on good quality local data uh, from, from routine surveillance. That was not yeah. Would, would this would this add uh, mean uh, much more effort by NMCPs to do this, or could we just rely on, you know, existing data to do to do the, the stratification as before? So I th so I think yeah, if you had great surveillance, then you could do it in real time using this this kind of surveillance. I think I think that would be that would be that would be ideal in in a, in, in in an absence of data, an absence of good good surveillance, then you have to rely on these geospatial models that are driven by associations, and um, and I think you just need to be very careful. You need to really validate your your strategy. Uh, go to a place that you say that your models say doesn't have um, high malaria, and just test that, and then go to a place which say it does and test that. So. It, the model will provide a hypothesis that you can then validate in different different se sectors. Um, but you know, uh, it's it's it, it, the complexity of the disease is driven by the complexity of the system. And mosquito, you know, it is really really complex, much more complex than, for example, viral transmission or or something like that, because you've got yeah. multiple organisms that we don't really understand involved. Yeah, a very theoretical question here uh, on the question of R not the reproductive number. Yeah. What is the relationship between this and heterogeneity and how come when you have heterogeneous uh, 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 transmission environments, you have uh, are not going up so much? Well, so so imagine a situation where, yeah, perhaps call it me, I, I just get bitten a lot. I go into a site and, I, and there's a lot of, you know, every mosquito straight towards me. If I'm infected, then I can go on to infect so many people. And because I'm being bitten so much, the chance of me in being infected is is really high because I'm being bitten by so many mosquitoes. So so that kind of heterogeneity. If everybody was being bitten in an equal number, then that that would be um, then the R naught would be lower and heterogeneity would be lower. Whereas uh, if you were if you were um, bitten a lot, then heterogeneity goes up because you're much more likely to be infected and for infecting other people you can kind of think of this very similar to a kind of contact network in, in, in kind of for example viral transmission as in you know somebody who works in a shop or is a healthcare professional comes into contact with lots and lots of people and therefore they have a chance to transmit it much greater and it's the similar this kind of non-even mosquito biting that generates same estimates in, 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 in an area thank you so so much yeah thanks uh, did you want to add something, Ellie or Sheila? Oh, that, that, that makes good sense to me. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Sheila? Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Fred. Nothing for me at now. Perfect. So, so a number of questions here for Ellie now. If that's okay, and uh, you know, I'll ask uh, uh, my colleague Sheila to start us off on his. But Ellie, we're going to talk to you a lot about uh, the, the point you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, about, about these gaps. Um, Sheila, please. You're muted. Fred, could you take this one? Okay, cool. So, so in, 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 the, in the early days, um, you, know, men, you mentioned earlier that one of the concerns that you've had has been uh, uh, that, that ITNs are not, and IRS are not necessarily giving you the full extent of the coverage that you need, and that we need to start worrying about not just the mosquito behavior, but also the human behavior. Uh, the work at Imperial, uh, you know, based on our review of the, the, the published literature from Imperial, it appeared to have started mostly from the mosquito side uh, in terms of that. And then much later, uh, you guys brought in the human, uh, the human side. And from the mosquito side, you did uh, this fantastic review, looked at uh, existing data, but also had a number of research questions, some of which are now already answered, but some of which are still being answered. And then later, uh, uh, you introduced the, cons the, the aspects on the human side, which recently we've seen also has extended to some incredibly nice work on individual level heterogeneities in Burkina Faso, which, which, is, which, which, which you, can, you guys can feel free to talk about here as well. But before we go forward early, it would be nice to just describe to our, our you know, party today, how this process came about, you know, uh, what the methodological uh, uh, issues um, uh, fixes 
you guys made. Uh, this was the most comprehensive analysis of human mosquito contacts in the spaces during which ITNs can protect you and the spaces beyond which ITNs cannot protect you. Uh, and some incredibly uh, interesting numbers here as well, you know, like 10.6 million more cases, uh, possibly associated with uh, just uh, um, the outdoor biting. So talk to us a, lot, a little bit about this entire process, just from a methodological perspective and why it's important. Back to you, Eli. So, um, and by the way, yeah. uh, congratulations on this uh, fantastic analysis. Uh, this has been really useful for many of us. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, th I think it, it started that we just wanted to sort of quantify this this concept that is talked about, this residual transmission concept. So we, we wanted to just try and quantify it, essentially, which is um, sort of the first step. And so... This is really something I think was it Jamie Griffin's original um, work or might have been Lemanac before him. Um, but basically using this idea of the proportion of bites happening indoors and the proportion of bites happening in bed. Um, and to get at that, those values, um, we take essentially the hourly kind of overlap time between mosquitoes biting and, and human activity. So this was actually an um, initiated by Yanetta Scarp as a, a, a PhD student. Uh, well, I think she was a BSc, BSc student at that time. Um, and so she sort of started off with the, the human land and catch um, data search across um, the literature. And then we sort of carried it on after the project had finished to sort of build up a few more data sets and add in the, the, the human and um, sort of mosquito profiles and things like that. Um, so, yeah, the, fir the first part was basically trying to reach out to people. Joining up with PAMCA was really useful for, for this and um, trying to just get those, those databases and, and build that database. Um, and, then, and then it was sort of a bit of a data management challenge, I guess, because you've got obviously lots of data in different forms. So you've got sort of, I had, I think, 4, 4 p.m. till um, Six seven a.m. Um, data and uh, and then and then building that up for the human um, sort of element of this as well uh, and then the so that then D E and F in this is just a sort of smooth fit across those data to try and understand um, any differences in indoor and outdoor biting um, and yeah and then and then the sort of process of it is you take each of those data sets in each country from the mosquitoes and contrast it with, I think if, if we had the exact country, we could look at those data specifically if we had some understanding of human behavior in, in, a, in, a, in an individual location. And again, this comes down to local knowledge and you know, this is, there's lots of assumptions here because we don't have those specific data. And even within a country, there's gonna be a big range in what's going on. Um, but we took, I think the, the mean, estimate of proportion of bites indoors and a proportion of bites in bed and then compared it with every mosquito kind of situation in, in each country to get our range of, of um, probable bites indoors and in bed um, in each country. Um, and then the other piece of data from here was we had those data ranging from 2000 onwards. So we had quite a, a long time series. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is also sort of in one of those interesting questions of, you know, is it really a, a change because of the pressure from indoor interventions that they've now looked like they're slightly more outdoor biting or is it because we've targeted indoor mosquitoes so now there's outdoor biting is left? So that kind of question was one that remained at the end of this work. Um, yeah. Do, do we have an answer to that question? And maybe from our entomologists on the line, do we have a clear answer to this question as to whether this outdoor biting is a result of indoor interventions or if it is just a subset of mosquitoes that are remaining? Ellie, you're saying that this was still a residual question at the end of your work. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I haven't seen, I think there's still some evidence leaning in both directions and. So I don't know if it's a sort of whether it is one of those things that's happening. Both things are happening 
to think be Ocker yeah. Island looked like it was it was sort of killing off the indoor ones and, and leaving outdoors, but then other locations you see in the shift to crepuscular biking. So. And, and you can't do the experiment when you can't. We've got communities which have bed nets because you know that that you cl you clearly can't take away any intervention. So so it's just difficult to to do. And to yeah. Do yeah. Shella, did you want to call on? Yeah, perhaps we can call on Professor Joe Lines to sort of take us back to hotspots. I see. Um, I don't know if he's still on the line. Um, but I see your comment there on focusing on why we shouldn't focus on hotspots. Um, Professor John Lyne, would you like to chime in or expound on this? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, let me just say what I said in the chat. But, but just to comment on this recent uh, conversation, I think we identified long, long, long ago uh, in the aftermath of the Garki project, that what really, really, really matters is whether these behaviors are purely phenotypic, because many of these things, including the early biting uh, and changes in biting times and changes in indoor-outdoor, observed indoor-outdoor ratios, they can be purely phenotypic and short-term responses to the presence of an excitoripellent insecticide inside the house. And what matters, what makes them completely dangerous for our efforts of malaria control is if they are rather inherited and evolved. And unfortunately, since that Gatton paper, um, the evident efforts to find out whether those changes are heritable, I don't think they've been made enough. I, I would emphasize that as a finding in relation to this behavior change story. In terms of the hotspots, um, yeah, I remember being very impressed by the tenfold variation we saw in villages three, four kilometers apart in just one small district in Tanzania. Very impressed at the instability of the mosquito numbers, their age structure, everything. Uh, but in those circumstances, at least in, in lowland tropical Africa, uh, even in the lowest transmission village, transmission was still very intense. And therefore it really wasn't true that focusing on the relative hotspots in that kind of place would, would allow malaria in the spaces in between to drain out. And I do think that, that just in terms of our messages to outside, uh, that kind of, oh, well, actually maybe we don't need universal coverage, that kind of message we have to be very careful about, over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Joe. Um, Fred Ross, would you like to continue? Okay, yeah. So we can go back to Eli. Uh, thanks also, Joe, for uh, uh, addressing the question of whether this outdoor phenomenon was a direct response from ITNs or if it is uh, something purely phenotypic. And, and Eli, we do have uh, a slide here with the findings from your work. A, a gentle but clear trend there. Um, as you can see, this for proportion of mosquitoes biting indoors, uh, proportion of uh, uh, um, um, mosquitoes biting during bedtime, and so on. A, a number of uh, indicators that you looked at there, and you do see some clear trends, even though they are they are marginal, right? Yeah. yeah. Did, did you want to talk yeah. a little bit about this? Yeah. Sure, yeah, so, so it was um, a marginal trend, but it was a trend. So yeah, so we did see this kind of, and we actually, um, we, so we, we sort of ch changed our estimate in the transmission model on the basis of this. So we've dropped, dropped our, our sort of estimate of proportion of mosquito bites indoors down by about five percentile, percentage points, I think, something like that. Um, as a result of, of doing this, this analysis. Um, I, I was actually really interested in the different um, geographic patterns, um, partly because I think it highlights that, you know, you can, you can be using, you can be doing a fantastic job as a program in two different locations, getting nets to everyone that can possibly use them and, and IRS as well. And 
you would have not necessarily a great effect, but it wouldn't be because your effort wasn't great. It would be because just the mosquitoes and humans behave in that way in a different space. So I, for me, that was quite an interesting thing to pull out just to say, you know, if, for example, somewhere in Zimbabwe was being compared to somewhere in Ethiopia, both efforts of the actual teams could have been equally great, but you would have seen a better impact in Zimbabwe. So it's that kind of that kind of messaging, which is quite important if if programs are rewarded for 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 achieving certain things when actually that you know they could be achieving everything possible um given the, the local situation. So I, I found that geographic um pattern quite interesting as well. Fred, you're muted. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I guess this is the point that uh, uh, Tom had emphasized earlier that when it comes to some of these data sets, it's best if it's as local as possible and that the decision making. So I, I guess, I mean, would it be right to say that, that your work helps us at a more global level to focus on this as a problem, but that in terms of how we respond to it, uh, individual countries in the different jurisdictions must aim to collect a little bit of this information to assess whether this is a challenge in those ecosystems. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think that's a really good summation, yeah. All right, uh, Shela, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, Ellie's still with you. Um, so we've actually um, realized, or, or we actually know there's confirmation that uh, we are still dealing with outdoor biting and outdoor resting mosquitoes and the current tools, ITNs and IRS, may not necessarily target um, th these types of vectors. So on a more realistic level, um, thinking about more sustainable interventions, uh, what is your opinion here on which interventions we should be using um, and how we should be targeting them? Yeah, yeah I think it's a really critical question. Um, and there's so many directions you can think about in, in this space. So I, I think to me, it makes sense to try and do everything possible in the local environment to minimize the possibility of biting. So if you have, if you, you know, if you know, you can put on sort of eave blockers and, um, you know, if, if the metal roofs are working, if, if, if you can do that kind of household transition, um, if you, I think in a paper read recently from the Bova Network, they had sort of elevated the household and almost hidden the people from the mosquitoes, which sounded quite a fun kind of approach. So anything like that, anything like engaging the local community to empty breeding sites around the houses, you know, so empty the water. The, the, all of those things to me make really good sense because they're things you can do locally for, for minimal cost. You can just sort of minimize the risk. Um, as a first point of call. And then, and then you can start thinking about the kind of citing new tools that, that, that we have, things like ivermectin maybe, things like gene drive maybe, things like certainly larval source management, I think is, 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 is certainly one that's coming back into people's um, sort of radars and, and rightly so. I think that when you look at places that have eliminated, there's almost always some kind of element of environmental action. Um, it might not be a chemical, it might be BTI or, or some other lava siding or just simply clearing um, water, water bodies around where people are living. So I think, I think there's a huge amount that we can do sort of just through education maybe and through engaging communities to sort of um, get active in, 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 if, you know, I appreciate it's, <laughs> it's a very difficult problem and, and these other interventions are going to be really useful as well, but that would be certainly something I'd, I'd love to see as a start point. Yeah, thank you. Tom, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think, you know, I think, I think it's, I think it's really, um, yeah, I completely agree. I suppose some of the kind of local context though, again, will drive these decisions and I'm, I'm just repeating myself, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> thank you, Fred. Any, any further questions there? Yeah, so, you know, usually when we ask people this question, they start mentioning, oh, repellents. Uh, um, what else do they mention usually? Love they mention a lot of these tiny little things. 
that you do this. I will ask Ellie, she's talking about community engagement, you know, housing, environment, and this is, this is, this is kind of really refreshing. Yeah, that's good. And I would just like to, you know, let our audience know that if you, if you have, uh, if you would like an opportunity to make a specific contribution to this subject, uh, do let us know either by raising your hands or just by a direct chat message. And we will, we will call you in or just, 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 just jump in and let us know, uh, really. Uh, I, I see some interesting conversation here between Victoria and Paul and also uh, uh, Joe Wagman. This is uh, the points about HLC. We, we appreciate, we appreciate this and, and urge you to continue this conversation. One specific question about the new tools though, that we have for Tom and Ellie. A lot of people are talking about ATSBs. You know, it's like the next big thing, um, attractive targeted sugar beets, used to be called attractive toxic sugar beets. Apparently toxic is not a good word. So now they call it targeted. Uh, Lots, lots of news about it. Um, um, you know, people believe that it's going to be the next big thing. We would like to hear from your perspective, you know, based on some of the work that you've done. And here is some really good data from Mali um, uh, by Trore and, and, and team here. Saying, for example, in, uh, one interesting observation that Toxic sugar beets are very good at killing older mosquitoes that are known to be uh, the, the most important in malaria transmission. We'd like to hear your opinions about how this would address some of the challenges that we've highlighted before with the uh, uh, outdoor biting, for example. Uh, we can start with Tom and then Ellie. So yeah, I, I agree. It's really it's a really exciting uh, tool, um, and I think it's there aren't too many tools in this space, so that's why it's a really 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 exciting tool um uh, i think i think you know we are going to have to really understand how this works and i think i think that compare for example the uptake of bed nets and larval source management you know larval source management you know unlike a bed net you know at a time when people go to bed influence the effectiveness of it but generally a lot of mosquitoes bite when people are in bed so they're always generally going to be effective larval source management you know it can be immensely effective but it's all really dependent on the effort you put in and so it's quite hard to extrapolate how uh larval source management in one location which might have a very different hydrology to larval source management in a different thing and as ali said you might be having exactly the same effort but you'd be having very different outcomes and i think uh atsb will be in this category you know we 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 make the assumption that these things are going to vary quite a lot with local local uh, conditions and, and and so therefore it's going to really need to understand the local sorry I keep repeating myself I should just put a kind of tape recorder so understand the local conditions <laughs> and just play it every few minutes because that's local, local. what my, my conversation yeah. ends up being um, but it's going to be those kind of things that determine local effectiveness and so so I, I'm really excited by this and I think uh, it it holds lots and lots and lots of potential, and uh, and I, I look forward to understanding the really interesting biology that will determine its effectiveness. Yeah, do we have anybody on the call who has worked on ATSPs? Anybody who can help us here? The likely potential. Yep, um, Fredras, Eric here. Yes. Yes, Eric, please, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so we are currently evaluating. I mean, it's not ATSBs yet. We have so far been evaluating the ASB um, formulation. So this is the formulation without toxin in it. And what we did was we added uh, dye in that. And, and the idea was to try and estimate feeding rates as, as an indicator of, of potential impact. And we do see pretty high rates of feeding, which from... Um, some modeling work that is being supported by the Oxford group and um, the Imperial College group, uh, we estimate that as low as 2.5% feeding, daily feeding, could, could, could result in, in, in as high as 30% uh, reduction in, in, in malaria incidence. And so um, in, in places like Zambia, we're reporting as high as um, 20 to 30% um, daily feeding rates. So um, there's a chance that uh, ATSBs really will um, potentially um, end in um, reduced uh, malaria incidence. They're, they're wow. looking very promising, yeah. Wow, 
Wow, that's 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 great. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Eric. Joe and Joe, the two Joes. Start with the first Joe. Who, which one is the first Joe? I'd be curious. The, the one to know. with a shorter name. Uh, so anyway, I would defer to the other Joes. The first Joe, uh, <laughs> Professor Lines. Oh. <laughs> I, I was Professor assuming you'd be uh, okay. My point is, I think. The results I've heard of for ATSBs are for yeah. relatively dry places where you have to look around to see where you would take some sugar if you were a sugar hungry mosquito, male or female. Um, for those places, I think it's really exciting. But I think the problem of generalizability and that local variation, which we've been talking about all afternoon. Okay, like when I like one that. That's been underestimated. Where I worked in Tanzania, there was never a season without a tree in flower, never a season without some fruit on the ground, different kinds of fruit in different seasons, but some fruit. So no shortage of other sources of sugar. And my guess is, I think we have a priori reason to expect that that will cause variation in effectiveness depending on those local settings. And I worry that the trials have not been designed with that in mind. Over. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Uh, the other Joe. <laughs> uh, I'll just reiterate everything that the first Joe just said. I think those are all really critical points. I do say that I think in the current trials, they have tried to build in some of that ecological diversity and we hopefully will get a peek at how natural sugar meal availability affects you know, feeding on the bait stations across different transmission settings. So that is a really interesting point. Another caveat that I want to say about the way we're currently evaluating the ATSBs and the ASBs, I, hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying this, but the way they're being deployed is that they're targeting precisely the same mosquitoes that are targeted by all the other interventions that we have. So it looks like we're going to be measuring the impact of transmission driven by Anopheles gambi and Anopheles funestis. And so I think what we're going to get is some compelling evidence that huh, here we have another tool in addition to the other ones that can provide additional incremental impact. Now, how to use these new tools to target residual transmission or transmission by other species is gonna require us really digging into the biology of sugar feeding. And that is a big black box that we really don't know much about. So anyway, all that is to say that I think we're sort of primed to deliver some really compelling evidence that there's a ton of potential, and then we're gonna have to learn a lot more about how to use it. Oh, thank you, thank you, guys, so so much um, uh, for that. Uh, let's let's wait and see. Uh, Eric, is that new hand or earlier hand? So new, new hand actually. So um, okay. just just wanted to respond a little. Um, so the one thing that I think I like about the, the manner in which the current trial is designed, I'm, I'm being all positive about this, is we had a very interesting experience in Kenya. So we had a period of um, extreme drought, and um, maybe I'm not supposed to say this yet, but we had. Um, in June, July, we were doing the ASP trial and our feeding rates dropped to almost zero actually. And uh, that coincided of course with the period of drought. The moment it started draining, what we saw was that the feeding rates magically started improving again. Which in my opinion means that even if we were to look at different ecological variations, chances are ATSBs will still work. Just because um, they are going to be working in the period when it's raining, which is likely the period when you have the highest uh, mosquito abundance. And therefore, I think that even in the most difficult of terrains, even in, in, in the areas that are likely to be ecologically challenging, HSBs could potentially work. Then the other thing, trial we have been doing, um, we have some small trials we've been trying to do um, some attractancy testing, comparing local, um, uh, local vegetation that we are aware um, are attractive to mosquitoes, one of them being mango and comparing that to ATSBs. And we do see pretty high attractancy to ATSBs. So even, I, I think even in places that have really diverse um, um, vegetation that may also be attractive, they're likely to compete pretty effectively. Over. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much for, for joining in to explain this. Uh, this is a technology that people are looking up, looking forward to uh, quite, quite a lot and, and we are all, uh, very excited, if, especially if it's going to address a gap uh, uh, and that we will not face the same questions that we, you know, about like, should it replace 
IRS or ITNs or is it something that's giving additional value? I know that my colleagues at Ifakara are using their semi-field systems to recreate vegetation covers that are of different densities and, and, and answer this question more empirically. So hopefully that data becomes useful as well. Let's go back to, um, to Tom and Ellie. Are you guys still there? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So I hope you do not mind that we had a detour. No, and, not at all. Uh, and have a great, great conversations with the two Joes and Eric. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for that. Uh, Ellie, any last comments on ATSBs or shall we proceed? Um, no, yeah, happy to go. And maybe just to say there's a couple of questions on the um, the effects on non-target insects. Um, okay. So I think, I think Justin commented too, so maybe he would want to comment now, but um, my understanding is they've been quite heavily tested on, on that. Um, and the way that the membrane basically is, is made so a probing insect can, can reach the sugar, but not a non-probing insect can't. So a biting insect essentially can. can. So, so yeah, that is something, yeah, that is obviously a concern for everyone involved, but seems to be okay at the moment, which is good news. And, and uh, we are hopeful, Shelley and myself are hopeful that we're going to have a masterclass on new tools and that will include cool. ATSPs and ectocides, spatial repellents, uh, and, and this kind of stuff. And hopefully you guys will join us as well for that conversation. Let us move on to, uh, Shela, shall we move on? Yes, yes. Yeah. Let us move on to uh, another important question, topical question here. And uh, we start with Tom. And Tom, I asked you this question before. I'm going to ask you again for the purpose, of, for the benefit of the masterclass. <laughs> oh, suddenly, suddenly muted. How important is pyrethroid resistance in the current vector control space? So, so for me, and I mean, I, yeah, just generally. I, okay. I, I, you know, I. There's, a, there's an awful lot of talk about it, and I think um, uh, some, some really great points made on all sides. And I think, I suppose I want to say a few things. Um, firstly, I think people, people say, oh, resistance, resistance bad, therefore that means that tool isn't working. And I think that's the first kind of thing that I would like to kind of argue against. I think you can have resistance uh, to a degree and the tools still be working but not as well as they would have been working without resistance so i think that's a really important thing we're not saying these don't work they clearly clearly do work um uh, but pyrethroid nets uh, are, um, <coughs> are 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 having their efficacy well I, I i i'm i'm in no doubt that pyrethroid nets are less efficacious against mosquitoes than uh, they were in the past and as resistance has spread, this is going to increase. And I think the, the kind of problem becomes extrapolating it to the epidemiological impact. And I, th I think this becomes, uh, people fear that actually by saying that pyrethroid resistance is a problem, that actually it will be harder to get people to use bed nets, investment in bed nets will go down. I think that that, that, that shouldn't be the case. Because I think, no, they are not working as well as they were working in the past. They're still immensely affected. Um, and I think... Personally, the entomological evidence is, is really clear. Uh, you get a couple of mosquitoes, you put it on a net, and many fewer die than they did in the past. How, and, and then you do that in a kind of cup of mosquitoes, you do it in an experimental hut. You see the same, the same pattern. And then you take it to the epidemiological situations, uh, and you see um, uh, results that are really consistent with what we've seen in the entomological surveys. So in the experimental huts, we're seeing the same, the same, um, uh, same um, uh, signs. The models predict the same thing as we are seeing in the epidemiological study. So when we include information on the level of resistance as defined by a discriminatory dose bioassay, which we know is not the greatest tool in the world, our model predictions improve their accuracy if we kind of keep this information. So I, I think there's... All the evidence out there is consistent. There could still be other reasons, for example, why, uh, uh, for example, we're seeing uh, PBO nets being more effective than uh, standard pyrethroid only nets. And that's because potentially they're using a higher concentration of insecticide. But given the stuff that I've seen about the relationship between the concentration of insecticide 
and mortality induced, I don't think that, that increase in uh, concentration of insecticides is enough to explain the real big additional public health benefit that, that mosquito nets with um, uh, PBO have over mosquito nets with pyrethroid only. So I think for me, I am in no doubt that insecticide resistance is causing, uh, is reducing the effectiveness of bed nets. Bed nets are still immensely effective, but they could be more effective if we had insecticides on there that were um, uh, more toxic to mosquitoes. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And, and just just for uh, for our colleagues on the line, the the purple curve there is PBO curve. Um, sorry, we, we picked it up without the label. Uh, the, the purple curve there is the PBO curve, and uh, uh, in this analysis. Uh, Tom went straight ahead to directly suggest PBO nets. So <clears throat> clearly <clears throat> the conviction there that IGNs would be better if they were killing more mosquitoes. Sheila, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's interesting, Tom, that you mentioned um, the comparison between the susceptibility assays and the experimental heart um, outcomes. So I, I was just curious as to whether you could comment on the other outcomes other than mortality in the experimental heart. So feeding inhibition, deterrence, mm -hmm. excitatory repellency, and, that, and how those relate to resistance. So, so you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a really good question. Yeah. And that is the, the, the benefit of bed nets. They're not only killing mosquitoes, they're also providing a physical, uh, a physical uh, barrier. And so the nice thing about experimental huts is you can look at all of these different characteristics that we think influence uh, the effectiveness of bed nets. And that might be that a mosquito looking for a blood meal might go to water house and then be more likely to go into a hut that does not have a bed net. And this is something we call deterrence. Um, this is this is something that kind of you know, the kind of the dissuasion of a mosquito for going into a hut that has a uh, somebody using a bed net. Those that go in could either, uh, they could uh, hit the net and die. They could, uh, they could just leave. They could be uh, antagonized by an insecticide, not go for uh, a blood meal and, uh, and, then, and then be caught in the trap outside, or they can successfully feed uh, through the holes in the nets. And so I think we've got these nice kind of different kind of behaviors that are captured in the HUT trial. My, for me, the most epidemiologically important one is the mortality, because you kill a mosquito, you take it out of action, you protect everybody around you, it becomes a public health benefit. In fact, uh, the actual blood feeding inhibition, I think, is, is a bit more kind of uh, not real, because uh, the huts, the huts are, um, holes are made in the huts, in the, sorry, not the huts, huts have got holes in anyway, uh, in the nets, holes are made inside the nets, and so mosquitoes can go in there, and so actually blood feeding might be higher because of because of those holes. But also, we found from our, we did a meta-analysis of these experiment trial data, and we actually found that blood feeding inhibition was much less sensitive to changes in uh, over time than actually uh, mortality was. And so, you know, there are, there is still some blood feeding inhibition, but there's less, yeah. but it's you, much less. Do you want less, me to show that? Uh, <coughs> because we have, we happen to have a slide on that, Tom, if you want me to show it. Oh, how, 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 how foresighted of you. Fantastic. Uh, I think we do, actually. Uh, uh, sorry, it means we have to skip towards the end, but there we go. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is, this is some work that was done with uh, many of the people such as Corinne and others are on the call and was, was collated together by Rebecca Nash and others in my group, we kind of did a meta-analysis on all of these kind of uh, behaviours. And, and as Corinne described in her masterclass, the reason why these huts designs were initially done was because they were uh, intended to uh, mimic the housing of local, uh, local communities. And so you have these different design huts in different areas of Africa, uh, very nicely demonstrated here. But the, the design of the hut influences the effectiveness of, of the, the intervention. And you can see for a kind of West African hut, they're actually much smaller. And so what you see is uh, that mosquitoes are much more likely to come in contact with the net uh, and probably more likely to die. And blood feeding inhibition in these uh, these these. Uh, nets is actually because the mosquito is much more in contact with the net, can't get out very far, is much more likely to find a hole and get in. Where 
and you compare this to other nets uh, in the same net in different huts and you get slightly different uh, outcomes. And so I think all of these me measures of, of the effectiveness of these indoor interventions need to take into account these, um, uh, these huts uh, design. And, and, and I would encourage um, uh, people think of doing huts, uh, perhaps you use one of these standard designs as opposed to uh, developing their own style of hut. Because I think there's a kind of question about um, uh, variability and reproducibility. I think I, I, I would learn much more about malaria in an area if we used a, a kind of a consistent hut design than in each area developing a new type of hut. And I guess that's why the WHO gave guidance. And, and we have these three designs, which are which are nicely um, comparable with one another, because clearly it's very difficult to move a hut from site to site to sample the mosquito population. So I know uh, your colleagues in Ifakara did a, a nice job comparing some of those earlier uh, by actually building different design huts in different locations. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sheila, did you want to continue that or shall we go back up? Yeah, we can go back. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Tom, <coughs> for that. And, and <coughs> sorry, guys, my voice is, uh, is dying uh, temporarily. But we, we, Tom, thanks, thanks for the answers to the question of assistance. I think that the next uh, question we have here is, really a little bit of reality check here. I might have shown this graph to you in one of our discussions, but we had a, a wonderful masterclass with Professor Ranson and, and, and Corinne. And one thing that came up that was quite interesting for us was, and this, this slide is picked up directly from the masterclass we had with them, is they did this uh, analysis with lab data uh, where they concluded that even if insecticide resistance is present, that bed nets will still continue to work. Uh, one of their explanations was that it's uh, uh, suboptimal, uh, uh, sublethal effects of the insecticide on the nets. And, and they were thinking that, well, this insecticide, res insecticide will still work to a certain degree, even if mosquitoes are resistant, and therefore we shouldn't worry about ITNs, together with the barrier impact and so on. But then fortunately, they had work in Burkina Faso in some of the places with very high resistance. And, and that is where you have the second graph uh, paper there. And here they went into the field and tried to do the measures of these sublethal effects that they had hypothesized in the PNAS paper. And as you can see here, they don't see any of that um, sublethal impact. It kind of disappears under high, trans high, in high resistance scenarios. On the basis of this, uh, Tom and Ellie, could one argue that when resistance intensities go very strongly, that we are eventually going to lose even the minimal power of insecticides that we still have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go first. And um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, it, and it also makes sense. You know, if 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 I eat a particularly dodgy sausage or something, and and it makes me feel, you know, the, the worst situation. If I've got no kind of tolerance to that kind of thing, I, I I would die. But then, if I had some degree of tolerance to it, I might feel ill. And not go and eat another sausage for a while um, and and i think it's the same kind of sorry this is a terrible analogy i think it's the same kind of idea here as in you get higher levels of resistance you get less of these sublethal impacts and so i think i think that what we have to appreciate is that we have very poor measures of assessing the level of resistance in a community this discriminatory dose assay as as Karin and, and, and Hillary said, uh, you know, it was designed for specifically an early warning system for resistance. It does not relate to the concentration of insecticide on the net. And so this might be an early warning system, but we need to have understand using intensity bioassays uh, and genetic markers quite exactly how much resistance is in that community because it's it's not a binary thing. And so so I think as you get higher intensities of resistance, this these sublethal impacts are. Are, are, are lost and therefore you know as resistance spreads and gets stronger and stronger and stronger you might have this initial protection from an epidemiological impact but ultimately uh, it's going to come through and, and similar to this you know the reason why we haven't seen cases rocketing up is because the spread of resistance has happened over the same time scale as the number of people using nets has ha has increased substantially and so as nets have gone up resistance has gone down i'm not saying cause and effect there but because of those two competing things that actually you haven't seen dramatic failures of nets in particular locations yet though 
as intent in resistance levels increases, that might become increasingly evident as effectively coverage plateaus and you don't get additional benefit from protecting people by just giving out more nets. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Ellie, would you like to uh, uh, comment a little bit on this as well? How should we address uh, that? Uh, how, how should we get ready uh, for the future? You, when we asked you earlier about the new, how do we address these gaps? You had uh, some unconventional answers to that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your unconventional answer to this, to this would be. How should we get ready for the day when resistance is too strong to block? Oh, it's a, yeah, I can <laughs> have, a, have a go at some unconventional thoughts. Um, I, you know, I, I'd love to get to a point where, you know, we maybe don't need the insecticides and we can, you know, have, a, have you know, with our environmental changes and, and maybe behavioural changes, but you know, that's probably an unrealistic wish. <laughs> um, I think there are things that, that we can we can certainly do in terms of we so it, it, any net if it's untreated it's still going to protect the individual so if you if you've maximized the number of insecticide treated nets you've got and then you can top up people using untreated nets maybe if, if that's one way to kind of increase your coverage um you know if if, if your insecticide's not killing you could also do things like pair up your your nets with other interventions that are killing mosquitoes in other ways so maybe in in mechanical ways I think there was one net that um, uses a kind of mechanical approach um, but you could also pair up the use of nets working as well as they possibly can with with some acceptance of resistance um, with things like um, the ATSB where you've got different chemistries being used or larva source management and where you're, you're sort of tackling the mosquitoes from a different direction, but you're still, you've always, I think having, sleeping under a net is always going to be a good thing for an individual. And if you can also kill mosquitoes, then it's always a good thing for the community, the wider community. So it's kind of thinking about how you can, if, if you lose the protection in terms of the killing effect, you still have a barrier effect and that's really strong. And you still want to have some way of killing mosquitoes to pair up with that if you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, Ellie, um, you've done a lot of work on um, how best to or which nets to use, whether PB or standard nets, um, given the insecticide resistance data or insecticide resistance levels. Um, so given the work that you've done, should we be using PBO nets uh, preemptively, assuming that there's resistance everywhere, irrespective of what intensity we are looking at? So the, the work that we've done so far does seem to suggest that PBOs do have this slightly superior impact than the pyrethroidone nets um, pretty much all levels of resistance other than sort of right the sort of no resistance stage so um, on efficacy I think if it, it was if it was feasible and the costs were you know allowing it then that would make sense if it, you know that I guess there is one angle of the conversation where it's sort of like you want to protect the tool that's still working so you know with any sort of insecticide intervention, you want to be like, thinking about rotating the, the mechanisms of action, the, the insecticides that have different mechanisms of action. So you want to kind of protect those chemistries and regain their benefit if you can by using sort of rotations or, or, or maybe dual action nets and things like that. But just on, on, on the evidence that we've looked at, it does seem to suggest that PBOs are slightly superior. I don't know if Tom wants to add to that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I think and this kind of tool that we that you kind of developed, most scenarios, it's much even even for different costs, uh, it's it's the most cost effective thing. And I think I think going back to the point that Christian made, I think you know we 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 just have to accept that we have to ex spend more money on these things because you know they are really 
amazing public health tools and and if we have to spend a bit more money on them then then we do because we've got to make the case of why it's important to invest that money um and and i think and i think uh, all evidence is that it is yeah so, and and uh, sorry fred so uh, so it's interesting um considering this question because when you look at yes we want to collect insecticide resistance data NMCPs want to collect data on intensity and mechanisms of resistance, but it comes to a point where they really don't have um, the capacity or the resources to collect this data. And so they're left with whether, as long as they've detected resistance, should they just go ahead and deploy PBO nets or should, must they collect data on, on intensity and mechanisms? So, you know, I would never not do the science. I think that that is that is is, is always good to do and justify you know, your, your investment. I think, you know, from from the data I've seen, you know, obviously there's, there's the WHO recommendations that you should always have metabolic resistance. And I, you know, I, I've seen very the data that I've seen that you shouldn't be using PBO nets isn't 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 great i think i think you know some of the kind of bio we, we've been using bioassays that are quite noisy and therefore um i you know i think i think in most sites situations we should we should we should probably be using pbo nets i think the trouble is we do need to invest in this capacity because down the line pbo nets are not working as good as pyrethroid did in, in areas of high resistance PBO, pbo nets are still you know, it's synergizing pyrethroid but you know mosquitoes are still developing resistance to them so we're going to need something much better than that. And there's these new generation of nets that, that, that are hopefully coming along that would be able to do that. But again, the kind of chem, the, the kind of mechanisms of cross resistance and other such things are complicated. So I think I think I completely understand with you from pragmatics, you know, we it's expensive to do this kind of entomology, but investing in that kind of expertise is only going to help us in the long run as we need to have more and more of this expertise to actually choose the next generation of vector control tools, be that ATSBs, be that IRS, be that with different types of bed nets. We just need that. And I don't think we can escape that. Um, and a sticky plaster would be just to put, to put BBO nets everywhere. And I think that would be beneficial, but I, I, it, can't, it can't be a replacement for, for good entomology. Yeah, thank you. So there's a related question in the chat. Does the widespread use of pyrethroid PBO nets increase the selection of pyrethroid resistance and hence only represent a temporary mitigation measure? Ellie? Sorry? <laughs> Sorry, I was going to suggest Ellie. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. so um, I'm just rereading re the question actually. So it's, I don't think so. I, this, I think that this is one I'd happily be debated on. I don't, I don't, this isn't, uh, but I don't, I don't think it would increase it any differently to pyrethroid nets already in circulation and pyrethroid chemistry used in agricultural systems and other places. So for me, it's not, it's not, PBO is not going to drive resistance anymore than what's already, what we're already trying to do. Um, I do think it represents a temporary mitigation, but as Tom mentioned earlier, and as nice paper with Steve Lindsay and others, um, you know, as, as they've said, high lethal resistance isn't the, it might, you know, might not be driving that loss of impact from nets as much as, you know, it's also we need to increase coverage as much as we can and, and, and other things like this. So I do see it as a temporary mitigation. I do think they still are working um, and we still need to try and get as many people as possible sleeping under nets. Um, that, that is a, you know, that is a tough task to get, to get those, those coverage numbers high, but that, that does work best. Um, yeah. So you, I think, I think they'll still last a, a, a nice amount of time and, and, and we have these other things on the horizon as well. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. Um, jo, your hand is up and, and I see you have responded um, to one of the questions, actually to that specific question. Please go ahead. Yeah, it was just really to say to say what Ellie's just said is that, that yeah, selection by pyrethroids 
it's perfectly strong enough, thank you very much. It's going to be really strong. But there are resistance mechanisms. They're not the ones that, that came up first and with other insects also. Uh, the, the pyrethroid resistance mechanisms that tend to come up first are these cytochrome oxidases that, that are also important in Anopheles. But there are other pyrethroid uh, detoxifying mechanisms that, that are not affected by PBOs and the experience in agriculture so that suggests that they may come up later, but they will come sooner or later. So pyrethroids are going to fail. Even the insecticides, the brand new insecticides that we are introducing now, not yet, but soon, they too will only buy some time. And we do have to think what's that long run stable way of suppressing transmission so that the absence of malaria will become a stable state in Africa? I think that's the, the difficult question. Over. Thank you. Back to you, Fred. Well, and, and on that point, you know, last year, <clears throat> we, we had reports from our colleagues in Cameroon suggesting resistance to neonicotinoids. And uh, a few weeks ago, I've seen on my Twitter feed uh, this. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Have you guys seen this? Uh, this is something that I've, I've seen on, on my Twitter feed recently. Uh, it's, I have to say though, it's, it's, it's with Culex, but you know, it suggests that it will likely develop against Anopheles as well. Should we worry about mosquitoes being resistant to PBO as well? I guess, I guess I'd say maybe not worry, maybe expect. And it, I think it will happen, as Joe said. And so, you know, uh, it's just, um, yeah, it's a case of, of yeah, trying to get as you, you like these nets, and we kind, I kind of want to think of them as like a stopgap. They're winning us time. We know they can work, and we can get the next things in. But whilst that's happening, we want to kind of do everything possible to make the problem as little as possible. So that's the kind of whole environmental change and. And, and local engagement and everything else that, that, that minimizes the transmission in the first place and gets, gets close as you can to, to that you know, state of zero. Thank you. And, and just so you know, this is a uh, work uh, from uh, Dr. Guyanian's group. Um, it's not published yet. I think it's still on BioArchive. Uh, any other comments, uh, Tom, on this? Yeah, you know, I think we know how evolution works. You know, evolution, and you know, we're never going to beat it, so we need to mitigate for it. Um, yeah, I completely. But you know, we just need to make sure that the communication of those these subtleties isn't kind of lost. Um, yeah. You know, I think there is a general kind of perception. Ah, oh, you know, uh, resistance. You know, we it, it's still not. You know, nets are still immensely effective and they will continue to be and get so more so if we have new chemistries, new new modes of action. All right. Thank you guys so, so much. Uh, thank you so much, Tom and, and Ellie. Uh, we have, uh, by my watch here, um, at, at best 10 minutes. Uh, and there's something special that we would like to do different today and on this masterclass. Uh, uh, that is that we would like to invite Tom and, and Ellie to share with us one decision-making tool that they have been uh, developing uh, because we believe that it, it provides some kind of an option of how countries would do these combinations of interventions. Um, we have these slides if anybody would like to see them, but just a quick highlight of what was what is coming next. And, and we will not discuss that today because of time. We were going to talk a little bit about indoor residual spraying. We have some work lined up here from uh, 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 Dr. Tangena on the, the slopes of uh, IRS S and also a systematic review by Eli, uh, suggesting here that we have to invest more on the long lasting formulations for IRS. Uh, and, and hopefully we will have a, a chance to focus on these tools, uh, on, this, on these questions uh, in the next masterclasses in the future. Shell already talked about the etymological indicators and we described this a little bit. One thing that you guys have done that we found a, you know, small but interesting was this uh, question about oocysts, which which 
happen to have very good correlation with the uh, prevalence and we wanted to hear a little bit more on whether this could constitute an alternative indicator. But because of time, we will not cover those questions in case instead we would like to invite you guys, if you don't mind, to spend the next uh, uh, few minutes to describe very briefly how this decision-making tool would be and how we can use it to simplify the modeling approaches for NMCPs uh, so that it's much more like a user interface and how we could, you know, a GUI rather, but how, how we could use this to accelerate uh, decision making uh, in the near future. So I'm going to stop sharing, and then I will invite you guys um, to share, and then we can come 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 back forward. Is that okay? That, that sounds that sounds great. And whilst Ellie's kind of getting it up, I will um, just say that you know, thank you for the opportunity to present this. It's this is very much work in progress, and that's why this I think is a great forum for for yeah. for kind of showing this. Ellie, you can really, share. Yeah, yeah. Really, really look. You know, this is this is our first attempt, and this is. You know, primarily Ellie doing this, and we need to um, uh, refine it with uh, the community and, and improve things moving forward. So, this please do if you have any comments, get in contact with us because this is, this is, this is we are we are not this is outside of our comfort zones. Um, yeah. This kind of brings us back to right at the start where we we're thinking about how to sort of, um, I guess, get access to modelling um, a little bit. So. This is actually a live um, website if, if anyone wants to have a look and, and, and we'd love to hear anybody's thoughts on it. We're still, as Tom said, developing things. Um, the way it works is you can um, start by naming a region um, and you can add in your details for that particular region. So I'm just going to do this. Um, so you can add in things like the population size, seasonality, um, the, the broad sort of malaria prevalence of, of location. In each um, sort of area, there's an information tab on, on how to fill these things in. And we have a, a sort of categorization of, of mosquito behaviors, which I'm sure entomologists will, will, will would like us to, to add more options to. Um, at the moment, we just sort of have this slightly arbitrary high and low um, scaling um, same for biting people and um, pyrethroid resistance levels um, based on the WHO uh, discriminatory dose bioassay estimate of, of proportion of mosquitoes surviving and whether the, the uh, there's evidence of PBO synergy or not in, in the local area. Um, and then you can also put in past vector control of, of the region so what, what's going on currently. Um, and then the idea is once you've entered all of these um, pieces of information about the, the location you're thinking about, um, um, you can start to see what to do next. So at the moment, um, we, we have two nets, uh, the standard LLIN and the um, pyrethroid PBO ITN. Um, you can choose uh, what level of usage um, you think your community will achieve. Uh, the way it works, uh, it will assume a kind of procurement of nets for the whole population um, as, as indicated here and as kind of understood by how many people are sleeping beneath the net and, and some sort of buffer. So we understand that, that countries will, will sort of add as a 7% buffer to make sure there's enough nets for everyone. And then um, you can also change prices. So the, these are um, entirely sort of user dependent. So depending on what, what you understand, the cost of different interventions is the delivery costs, which we assume to be the same for the two nets. Um, and you can also change your kind of IRS costs um, and depending on what you understand, if you wanted to use IRS in these areas. So that that's um, that's sort of the, the front that's online at the moment. We have an impact and a sort of ISA cost effectiveness um, claim. Uh, we have graphs and we have tables of, of the information. Um, so the idea is to kind of start to be able to play with these different metrics. So maybe you want to look at what would happen if you had a much lower kind of um, level of a level of um, pyrethroid resistance or maybe a much higher level. And you can start to see how that would change our estimated impact of that intervention and um, you could also look at what would happen if you had um, more or less coverage for that particular intervention or if you also added in some IRS in, in, in combination with the nets or, or on its own. Um, so once you've once you've kind of played through these different options 
what we're not offering yet online because we want to go through a process of trying to confirm that what we're strategizing makes sense in terms of if we actually look at a real place uh, and do this exercise um, that the model sort of modeled perfectly as, as well as we could do would give the same result as this tool might do um, that so so that's kind of this is the next stage which I'll talk through just to say that these are all we, we've done a, a systematic review of randomized control trials and, and, and confirmed that this is able to predict sort of 14 different RCTs. So, so we've got some validation that the, the model sitting behind this tool is actually working okay. Um, and then we have this strategization thing, which we hope will be quite useful for, for location. So you can actually set your own budget. So this could be, say, a million. Um, you can strategize across that. And what it will do is essentially give... Um, give you a, a estimate of what to do in different locations so I should have said there's you can put in lots of different regions as many as you as you want to strategize across um, what you can actually do which might be quite useful is you can say okay what if we had a slightly bigger budget or allocated a little bit more money to 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 the vector control and now it changes these sort of options that you can do across your different regions so this is if you click on any of these strategies it's saying the best thing to do to avert this many cases for this amount of money um, is, is, is this combination. So in, in region A, you'd want to do your pyrethro PBO. Um, maybe you can do pyrethro PBO and IRS and B and, and then PBO next again in, in, in the first one. So, so that's the kind of, um, I guess, idea of it is just to sort of say, given different budgets, um, it will strategize by saying, how do you avert the most cases within this budget that you set? Um, and then and then you can say, OK, what if we only had about 90 percent of that budget and you can look at what the solution would be for, for that. So so that's kind of the, the, the tool as it stands. Um, hopefully it has use already in its original phase, which is, is just looking at, at these kind of original start points where you can start to say, OK, how how do things look if you have a different um, level of end endemicity and you can start to sort of really understand um, and the, how the sort of mechanism of the model is 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 is, is est estimating what might happen, um, and, and then this strategization thing is, is is our kind of next step. But just just we wanted to sort of take the opportunity to get as much feedback as we could and and, and thoughts from from the community. So thank you for yeah the the time to to explain that. I'll I'll just stop there. Wonderful. Uh, uh, shall I you know, leave the discussion? Uh, Fredos 2.0 is uh, fairly active on this end. <laughs> Wonderful uh, uh, um, interface here. I, I love it myself. Uh, shall I please leave the discussion? Oh, I, I, I enjoy that background music every time you speak. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of... Um, yeah. yeah, please go ahead, Tom. Sorry. So I'm just going to say that, you know, at the moment, the decisions we have are, you know, we are based on WHO kind of recommended tools. The decisions that we have aren't, aren't huge and, the, and and it's actually going to be quite obvious in most situations what should be done. And, and this shouldn't, you know, this shouldn't be a kind of, uh, you know, this is a kind of like a broad kind of tool to help people explore these ideas in them. But as things get more complex, as we get more tools, more types of nets, with all different prices being quoted in different places, all different types of things like ATSB and other things, I think this will really help us start to see through these slightly more complex things. And, and the idea, hopefully, it would be a kind of, you know, to bring in other models and, and, and kind of, you know, this, this could be any any kind of model behind there and ideally use more than one model and, and such like that. Just and it, And it also shouldn't be a kind of, uh, a replacement for the kind of in detail modeling that, for example, uh, the WHO is doing with all modeling groups looking at the kind of high burden, high impact countries. You know, this is that's that modeling is still really beneficial, but this is a kind of tool that that can't be done everywhere. So, help other people explore their options uh, in their own particular ep epidemiological and entomological scenarios. And thanks again for the opportunity to show it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so Ellie, uh, maybe just one question from me about the flexibility of this tool and whether um, th there are opportunities to add in other indicators, such as, say, 
perhaps the net lasts two years um, or less than two years. I mean, the durability aspect of it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's a question actually that's come up a few times with different conversations. It's definitely on the list of of what to bring in. It, it's it's a difficult thing because um, the way we've set it up at the moment is we're slightly kind of computationally limited um, because every time you add in a new option, you have to exponentially increase how many simulations you do. But we're thinking we might change that. So, um, but but in terms of Kind of what we'd like to do yes that's definitely I think something that a lot of people are interested in in that kind of two-year cycle if if we switch from three to two years so this is obviously um just looking at three-year cycle at the moment it does have things like um the the lost impact from the mosquito net over time and an assumed kind of loss of people using nets over time because they might have got holes or they use for a different purpose or stolen or whatever else so, so we do have that kind of waning in, in, in the three year cycle, but certainly adding in an option for two years and three years is, is on the, is on the to-do list. <laughs> I can't, I can't promise when it will be in there, but it's, <laughs> it's on the to-do list. Thanks, Ellie. So there's a question on um, the applicability aspect of it and whether you've had a chance to introduce this to the NMCPs, maybe through trainings, and what their feeling is in terms of, you know, the financial um, aspect of it in terms of mixing all these interventions together? Yeah, it's a great question. So we've actually started out um, just quite um, personally with Antoine um, Sanu and Musa Gorgoriogo in, um, uh, in CNFRP and working with the NMCP team in, in Burkina Faso there um, to get sort of opinions on 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 it from from the that perspective from the nmcp perspective because that i think is our our hopeful sort of audience that, that this would be most useful for um we are really keen to now talk to as many people as we can now we've got this kind of first version prototype and so yeah if, if anyone does want to talk about it from that we'd be very happy to yeah hear your thoughts and and have discussions on, on where to go from here. Yeah, and, and it's free, is it free? <laughs> yeah, 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 totally free. And uh, <laughs> the, the version online now is just one region. Uh, you can look at lots of different regions, but it doesn't yet do the strategization. But that's just because I want to make sure that it's doing something sensible. So we're working a little bit with the Swiss TPH team and um, Emily Putan there, and um, yeah, Putan there. So, we, so yeah, so we, we, we'll validate that and, and then we'll and then we'll make that available to people. But yeah, happy happy to talk in, in private groups if, if that is useful at this stage, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Eli. Fred, do you have any additional questions? No, I, I just, I mean, like we started earlier, um, it's going to be necessary that as people focus more and more on the uh, combinations of interventions, it's going to be, sorry, I just have to bring up a, a, a slide for purposes of this. It's going to be important for us to, you know, for, for NMCPs to be able to do this, to, to make, you know, to design these combinations, even theoretically, and then, and then, and then run them in a way. So I, th I think that's important that, that, that we have a way that does not present mathematical modeling as an elite, elitist um, subject. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see this. And I, 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 I'm looking forward also that you guys can have conversations with people like uh, uh, Samson in Tanzania, they, they might be modelers in Nigeria or, 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 or in different countries to see how you know the, some of these things can be adapted. And I love the consensus idea as we discussed earlier. So for me, I just wanna say congratulations a lot. Uh, to, to all of you, uh, uh, really, for, for, for this and for everything else that you've taught us today. Um, uh, there's a hand by Mohammed. It's been for a while. Mohammed, did you have a specific question that you wanted to ask? Mohammed Dek? Mohammed Dek, I see your hand is raised for a while. Okay, we will lower it. Uh, 
otherwise, I just really want to say thanks, thanks a lot, and maybe ask you guys if you have any specific questions for us, or Sheila, if we have any final thoughts uh, from the from the crew. But I think this was a fantastic, uh, a fantastic opportunity. But the question there is really just for us to think about the future of. Uh, malaria prevention, what is it going to look like? And we don't have to answer this, but I think it's an important thing to think about. So I hand back to you, Shayla, for maybe we can ask our guests to give their final thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Fred. So perhaps before um, they share um, their final thoughts, there's uh, Tom and Ellie would like for you to sort of um, share um, your stories. Um, for example, um, when we are thinking specifically about modeling um, and how um, your work can be adopted by NMCPs or academic institutions or research institutions, what structures should we put in place? Should they be putting in place to be able to sort of adopt the models that you're doing to be able to have localized models for themselves? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think the investment in, 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 in people that understand these, you know, such as Samson and, you know, the kind of investment that goes into the AIMS network and, and, and more, I, I really would like to bridge these from the kind of the hardcore modelers to the kind of the people that actually make decisions. I think that's a really, that's a really key thing. And it's just demystifying some of these models and, 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 and just showing that, you know, it's, it's, you don't need to you don't need to be able to understand everything underneath the hoods to be able to uh, to be able to hopefully use this as, um, so you know I think you know, anything that we can do I can do you know to, to facilitate that process just just really just getting the kind of expertise in the kind of places that will actually use make these decisions I think is going to be really really key um, but also I think these kind of things you know I think I get incredibly angry about kind of malaria every now and again you kind of you look at it and you kind of you you do it on a day-to-day -day basis and and then you um you kind of get desensitized to it but I think we should really get first clever and then angry because uh you know we these tools can do all these kind of uh things we we need to be able to galvanize the community to do more and getting the evidence base for them and uh and then showing you know what we can do with this extra money i think is going to really make it harder for people not to give that uh, money in the future so i think i think yeah these these increased modeling capacity increase the evidence base for the interventions increase modeling capacity and then increase anger would really help uh, push push me down thank you angry modeling tom wants a lot of angry <laughs> angry modelers i'm a big man but i'm out of shape physically i'm no use <laughs> I have a specific question for you, Ellie. Um, we are all now talking about um, gender okay. equity. Um, I would like to, you know, for you to share share some thoughts around what has been the most useful advice that you've gotten from your mentors. Um, and and luckily today we have you and 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 Tom on the on the master class, which means. We are trying to, we are trying to honor that. But I just wanted to hear from you, like what what has been the most um, influential advice you've gotten from your mentors? Yeah, it's that's a quite a big question, I think. And um, I, I think, um, I guess to, I guess to just sort of, kind of follow your interest in a way so sort of basically so first of all sort of see yourself as equal in whichever conversation you're in and that is obviously vital for every person I think um, and I, I think I've been quite fortunate I, I love the women in malaria group and, and I think that's been a really supportive thing within our own kind of research space um, I've got really great mentors in um, people like Pro Professor Aswagani and our, our group who leads our group who's a phenomenal kind of example to, to, to women in science um, anyone in science actually but <laughs> so yeah but I guess just see yourself as equal value your voice um, and and yeah just 
just enjoy the work so probably would say that to anyone but yeah for women and yeah <laughs> so, yeah thank you ellie um so perhaps turning it back to you tom to share your final thoughts um i suppose i suppose everybody always says do what you do, do what you um what you love and i of course i wouldn't say against that but i'd also say kind of be be kind of flexible like my career i if i if i have to admit if i if i had set off and asked my 22 year old self do you want to become a mathematical model i wouldn't have, i wouldn't have said said it a million years but you know somebody somewhere had the foresight to to oh, kind of yeah. offer you know i couldn't mm. afford to do a masters but then somebody offered a, a scholarship to do a masters in mathematical modeling and 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 that that, you know that completely changed my direction and i've now been able to bring back into entomology <laughs> that that i um i actually originally wanted so i think you know look 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 for kind of directions and often there are kind of schemes that you think oh that could be interesting it's not exactly what i want but be flexible to those kind of situations because those schemes often exist because people have identified as need and you know i've been very lucky in my career because i got in on a, on a subject that was expanding and that and that was entirely based on um just that's that that financial assistance was there to do that kind of thing and so i think do if you're applying to to organizations such as the Wealth trust do look at what they um they're asking for um and and be flexible and be flexible to uh to do what you want to do but within that um that realm that will hopefully make it easier for you and actually to be part of a, a growing discipline as opposed to a shrinking discipline has really you know, made all the difference for me. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Fred to close. We've come to the end of, uh, of, of the masterclass session today. This was our 32nd edition of the Fakara masterclasses. Again, thank you so, so much, Tom and Ellie. And thanks to all our participants Thanks to all the audience uh, uh, who've been here. Your participation makes these masterclasses much more worthy. And of course, they are also streamed live on YouTube and they will remain uh, live on YouTube. Uh, for, they will remain on YouTube for a long time. The aim here is really to drive and to promote as much as possible a uh, scientific discourse around important subjects. And, and this is not to say the other types of discussions are not important, but we do see uh, the need to have detailed conversations in a long form about subjects that matter to us. And, and the, this masterclass series provides uh, that opportunity for us. Uh, of course, we, we like personal stories as well, like Sheila was uh, trying to get so that we can we can have a little bit of inspiration uh, uh, for this. We appreciate the work that is being done by people like uh, Ellie and Tom, mm -hmm. and we look forward to having a fantastic uh, next session. So like I said earlier, our next masterclass comes next week. It's going to be about uh, uh, access, coverage, and cost effectiveness of the vector control tools. And then we will have the 33rd masterclass, which will be delivered by Professor uh, Chris Druckley and Tom Bo and, and and, and tune Buzema, uh, uh, and we will provide information um, um, through our regular channels. Thank you again once uh, for, once more for this. Is you realize saying goodbye is difficult in these masterclasses, but I really have to say goodbye now. Thank you so so much. Also to you, my uh, uh, sister Shayla, uh, fantastic co-host uh, with whom we've been doing this now for thirty-two sessions, and we hope to continue doing them uh, as many as are necessary. I will stop speaking now and wish you all a fantastic Friday and a wonderful uh, weekend. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Sheila. Bye. Music from Fred was playing a piano, so if anybody wants to hang it out. <laughs> so.
Là, ils ont mis en 2014 de pied. Là, ils ont commencé. Mais quand ils ont de pied, là, toi aussi, il y a deux heures de décalage, il faut voir l'heure, c'est à l'heure française, à l'heure actuelle africaine. Quand tu mets en deux heures de décalage, toi aussi. Ah, quand même, je suis sûr que je suis 14h, c'est ici, c'est midi. 